So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner, Seminars, and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Service through policy research. In need of references for your research? Do you want a search engine that is easy to navigate? And do you want it free? If you are a student, researcher, or teacher looking for socioeconomic references and materials, then SERPI is for you. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website at www.pids.gov.ph and click the SERPI widget or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERP is an online database of socioeconomic studies and materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies and other academic and research institutions. SERP has a wide variety of socioeconomic materials such as journal articles, books, working papers, policy notes, research papers, and newsletters. SERPI has 52 partner institutions that contribute publications to the database. SERPI has a wide coverage of materials encompassing 20 research themes. You can search by keyword or author, by publication type, by research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 materials with full text that you can download for free. Enjoy searching! Visit SERPI now and follow us on Facebook. You may also send a message for inquiries. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan yung batas at polisiya para mas makita nila yung epekto at resulta nito. <clears throat> Pag nahuli tayo, wala tayo may sasagot. Kaya dapat pag-aralan din natin. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan ng mga batas at polisiya para malaman nila kung epektibo ba ito sa karamihan o magiging problema lang. Kung walang basehan ng isang batas, basta na lamang ipatutupad at walang pulso na kinukuha sa mga mamamayan, eh, mahirap. Mahalagang isa ilalim sa masusing pagsusuri ang mga polisiya at programa ng pamahalaan bago pa man ito ipatupad. Dapat ring ipagpatuloy ang pagsubaybay o pagmonitor sa mga ito habang ipinapatupad hanggang sa matapos ang kanilang implementasyon.
Dito pumapasok ang tungkulin na ginagampanan ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Ang PIDS, ang siyang sangay ng pamahalaan na naatasang gumawa ng pag-aaral at pananaliksik at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas at iba't ibang sangay ng gobyerno tungkol sa mga programa at pulisiya sa pamahalaan upang masigurong matugunan nito ang socio-economic needs ng ating bansa. Pag pinag-aralan, mas effective! Hello everyone, good afternoon. So while we are um, waiting, may I draw your attention to the uh, house rules which are flashed on the screen and let's go over them one by one in case you have questions. So for all attendees, um, you may have noticed that your microphone is automatically on mute and this is to prevent um, background noise. But this doesn't mean that you cannot join the open forum or join the discussion. So if you have any questions, just use the uh, chat box, which is located at the lower part of your screen. Just uh, type your name, your affiliation, and your question. And send it to um, all panelists or to everyone, not to a specific person. And I will read your question during the open forum. For those who are watching us on uh, Facebook, you are also very much welcome to participate in the discussion. Just um, uh, type your, your question using the uh, comment section of Facebook. And since we have limited time, please make your questions concise and related to the topic of our webinar. We still have three minutes left. So I'll see you at 1.30 and uh, 
feel free to let us know where you are connecting from. Thank you. A pleasant afternoon to all of you. Welcome to the PIDS webinar series where we discuss development issues based on data and evidence. I'm Sheila Fior and I will be moderating this event. The topic that we are going to discuss this afternoon is very timely as we are holding this webinar on the heels of two important international developments. A few days ago, the APEC 2020, which was hosted by Malaysia, ended on a high note with the APEC leaders including our own president expressing their vision of an open, resilient, and peaceful Asia-Pacific community by 2040. Earlier, 15 of the uh, 21 APEC member countries signed the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP, a highly anticipated trade deal. What do you think are the um, implications of this APEC uh, developments for the Philippines? But more than that, I think many of us are wondering what a regional economic grouping like the APEC means for the Philippines and how do the different uh, sectors, how do the different stakeholders perceive the APEC in terms of, it, of its importance, influence, and relevance? What is APEC's role in positioning the Philippines in the global economy? Our webinar this afternoon will try to answer these questions. And so to formally open our event with a um, much further ado, may I call on the president of uh, PIDS, Dr. Celia Reyes. Mamsel? Thank you, Sheila. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to acknowledge the presence of the following. Senator Aquilino Pimentel III, Congressman Christopher de Venecia, BBM Undersecretary Janet Abuel, DF. Oliver Delphine, BFA Minister and Consul General Adrian Bernie Candelada, and also Director Jim Tito San Agustin, 
and Acting Director Juan Carlos Borromeo, um, BSP Senior Director Thomas Benjamin Marcelo, and from NEDA, we have Director Thelma Manuel, Director Richard Emerson Ballester, OIC Director Mir Mirna Clara Asuncion. And from the Board of Investments, uh, we have Governor Marjorie Ramos Amaniego. And from Tariff Commission, we have Chairperson Marilu Mendoza and Commissioner Marisa Maricosa Paderon. Uh, Securities and Exchange Commission Assistant Director Malivien Ermitaño. And from the Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department, we have OIC Executive Director Novel Bangsal and Director Elsie Gutierrez. Uh, TESDA Certification Office Executive Director Maria Susan de la Rama. And of course, our very own uh, PIDS Board Member, Dr. Gilbert Orianto. And from the private sector, we'd like to welcome Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industry Director in Charge, George Barcelon, CPRM Consultants, uh, Vice President Manjid Sohal, Cargill Philippines uh, Corporate Affairs Director Christopher Ilagan, Manila Water Chief Operating Officer Perry Rivera, Udena Infra Corporation Assistant Vice President for Operations Manuel Hamonier. Uh, we're also joined today by representatives from the Academe, University of San Carlos President Narciso Celian Jr., Western Mindanao State University President Teresita Narvaez, Cagayan State University Vice President for Research and Development Junel Guzman, Jose Rizal Memorial State University OIC Vice President for Research Development and Extension Janet Ikao, Mindanao State University Iligan Institute of Technology Vice Chancellor for Research and Extension Jinky Bernales, De La Salle University School of Economics Dean Marites Tionco, University of Asia and the Pacific School of Economics Dean George Manzano and Vice Dean Peter Lee Yu. Malay College, Dean Jimmy Mamming, and Asian Institute of Management Associate Director, Gian Paolo Rivera. Uh, we're also honored to have with us uh, this afternoon, um, Ambassador, um, Philippine Ambassador to Portugal, um, Celia Ana Ferreira, and uh, First Secretary and Consul Reginald Bernabe. And also um, from the Embassy, um, in Mexico, the head of bilateral cooperation economic affairs, Juan Gabriel Espejo Ceballos. Uh, we're also joined uh, uh, by Unang Hakbang Foundation President Oli Lucas, Philippine Exporters Confederation Assistant Vice President Maria Florderiza Leong, and Philippine Center for Islam and Democracy Programs Director and Islamic Legal Studies from the UP Law Center Director Salma Pier Rasul. Tamahan ng Kabataang Voluntaryo ng Pilipinas, Deputy Regional Director Albert Lee, Masaganang Sakahan Director Daniel Agustin, and Bankers Association, Association of the Philippines Associate Director Arnel Almaden. And this afternoon, we have representatives from the media joining us from the Philippine Star, Business Reporter Ceriza Bal Valencia, Business Mirror Reporter Elijah, Elijah Feliz Rosales, and Manila Times Columnist Benjamin Critz. Let me also greet our guests, colleagues from the government, academe, civil society, media, private sector, as well as those who are watching through the PIDS Facebook page. Good afternoon and welcome to our weekly webinar. Today, our main presenter, PIDS Senior Research Fellow, Dr. Francis Mark Kimba, will be discussing two studies, which she co-authored with PIDS Research Specialist, Silwin Calizo, and PIDS Supervising Research Specialist, Mark Anthony Baral, respectively. The first paper talks about the result of the perception survey conducted to measure stakeholders' awareness of the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, or APEC. Particularly, it assessed stakeholders' perception of APEC's importance, influence, and relevance to the Philippines. The study also gathered their insights on how they envision APEC and the Philippines post-2020. The second paper shows us how the APEC has evolved as an institution the changes it has undergone, and the challenges it has faced in the past decades. The study also enumerated the roles of APEC in positioning the Philippines in the global economy. The Philippines' membership to the APEC is vital because it contributes to the country's foreign direct investments and exports. Millions of Filipino workers are also deployed across APEC member states. However, a recent report of the APEC Policy Support Unit, or APSU, 
show that the economic growth in the region has gone down by 3.7% in the first semester of 2020, primarily due to the pandemic. This is expected to contract further by 2.5% this year, which may result in an output loss of about 1.8 trillion US dollars. According to the APSU, this is the first time that the APEC region's economy would contract since inception 30 years ago. Moreover, the APSU reported a spike um, in the un unemployment rates among APEC economies, averaging about 4.8% as of September 2020, or equivalent to more than 74 million people looking for work. Also, as expected, there was a huge decrease in the volume of exports and imports in the region due to travel restrictions and closures of international borders. To cope with these challenges, the recent APEC regional trends analysis underscored the need for APEC economies to strengthen regional cooperation and for individual member states to introduce, implement, and enforce structural reforms to support recovery in the medium to long term. In the Philippines, the government is doing its share to stimulate the economy by building infrastructures, strengthening the services sector, and providing support to micro, small, and medium enterprises. We all know that MSMEs play a significant role in sustaining and stimulating economic growth, as well as in reducing poverty by creating jobs for the country's expanding labor force. To complement these efforts, I think it's important for the government to harness digital innovation in the country, enhance economic competitiveness, and engage more with APEC counterparts to learn their best practices and discuss regional perspectives so we will have a better understanding of the issues that affect us. To share more on these topics, we are honored to have with us Acting Assistant Secretary Eric Gerardo Tamayo of the Department of Foreign Affairs Office of the Undersecretary for International Economic Relations, and Ms. Mary Sherilyn Akia of the Department of Trade and Industries Industry Development and Trade Policy Group as discussants in today's webinar. Let me take this opportunity to thank Assistant Secretary Tamayo and Ms. Akia for accepting our invitation. It's our pleasure to have both of you in this virtual seminar. To our viewers, I hope you will all stay until the end of the webinar and actively participate during the open forum. I now give back the floor to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mamsel. So let us now proceed to the presentation. We are giving our, um, our presenter a maximum of 40 minutes and our discussions um, 15 minutes each. So to our speakers, you will hear an alert bell when you only have five minutes left and another alert bell when your time is up. Okay. Our uh, presenter is a research fellow at the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, and he is also the director of the, of the Philippine APEC Study Center Network, or PASCN. He has worked on a number of uh, research topics, including agriculture trade, and rural development. And his current research interest is um, on the innovation activity of local firms. He has participated in roundtable discussions on issues, on trade issues, on um, in industrial development, innovation, and e-commerce. He obtained his master's in international development from the International University of Japan. And he also obtained another MA and a PhD in development economics from the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies located in Tokyo, Japan. Friends, Dr. Francis Kimba. Dr. Kimba? Thank you, Sheila. Uh, am I, yes. Yes, we can am hear I you. Am I reaching yes. you loud and clear? Yes. Okay, great. Um, because this morning uh, we were having difficulties with my uh, internet, uh, uh, let me just uh, let me just uh, 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 turn off my turn off my video. Turn off my off video. Let me go turn off my. So we will conserve bandwidth. Uh, it's okay, Francis. So okay. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us in this. Ah, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for um, my presentation for today is based on two papers, written two papers, 
and last year. The first event, uh, and this was written with uh, Mark Anthony Barral. And the second is understanding the role of APEC in Philippine trade and investment results of a perception survey. Uh, and this was written with uh, Silwin C. Calizo Jr. and both uh, research staff at the Philippine Institute for Development Skills. So let me go to the next slide. Uh, in the next slide, I am showing you, as uh, Dr. Reyes has uh, uh, mentioned, um, there's a, we are actually facing a, a, a very difficult, difficult time which emphasizes the new globalization. Last year, in uh, 2019, September, the annual public policy conference of the Philippine Institute for Development Studies tackled the new globalization, which was brought about by the rapid development in, in technology and the decline in the cost of transport. These developments have allowed the ease of movement of goods, people, and even data across, across countries. And so the COVID-19 pandemic that we are all in now emphasizes the potential and challenges of this new globalization. The ease of movement of people has allowed the virus to spread across countries. And you can see here how widely it has spread. Almost all countries in the world have faced uh, have uh, COVID-19. And the importance of free trade and movement of goods, especially in the right side of the panel, you can see uh, the trade of um, medical products um, across countries. And you can find it sources of uh, and even you can see how important it is uh, China, Germany, and also uh, medical products. So globalization is important to the core region. There are important recently, as uh, Dr. Siar has mentioned, he saw the 27th APEC Economic Leaders Meeting held last meeting held, which was chaired by Malaysia with the theme uh, optimizing human potential as a resilient um, future of shared prosperity, pivot, prioritize, and progress. We also saw the um, 37th ASEAN Summit taking place last November 12, 2020. The highlight of the summit, ag summit agenda, high on the summit agenda is the leaders' discussion and approval of the ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework and its implementation plan, which will serve as the whole of community exit strategy to recover and build back better from the COVID-19 pandemic. In addition, there will be further discussions on the ASEAN travel corridor arrangement, which would facilitate the safe resumption of essential business and travel in the region. Also, in the we saw in the the Recently, the signing of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP agreement, following the conclusion of the fourth RCEP summit on, the, on 15th November 2020. The deal will improve market access with tariffs and quotas, it's and quotas eliminated in over 65% of goods traded and make businesses predictable with common rules of origin and transparent regulations upon entry into ports. So this will encourage firms to invest more in the region, including building supply chains and services and generating jobs. Generating jobs. So all these important events and the COVID-19 pandemic are very important background as to why we are looking at the topic that we are looking at now. So we want to see um, the next uh, course of the presentation. Uh, I'm presenting the outline in the next slide. The, um, first is I want to talk about uh, what is APEC? What is APEC? To provide an introduction of what is this um, community that we are in, and then provide some of the Philippine participation in APEC and some of the initiatives that uh, the Philippines has raised in APEC. And then we move on to the results of the perception survey on APEC, which was written with uh, Silvin. And then um, lastly, is um, some takeaways and some recommendations. All right, so what is APEC? In the next slide, we, I'm showing you who are the founding members. So who, what, what are the economies and the countries that comprise uh, APEC? Established in 1989, 
The founding members are Australia, Brunei Darussalam, Canada, Indonesia, Japan, Korea, Malaysia, New Zealand, of course, the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and the United States. The Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, or APEC, is a regional economic forum established in 1989 to leverage the growth of interdependence of the Asia-Pacific. There are 21 members, and, they're aimed to and they aim to create um, greater prosperity for the people of the region by promoting balanced, inclusive, sustainable, innovative, and secure growth and by accelerating regional economic integration. So who are the other member countries who are not the founding members? So aside from the 12 founding members, there's, um, we, also saw, we also have um, China, Hong Kong, Chile, Mexico, Chinese Taipei, uh, Papua New Guinea, Vietnam, Russia, and Peru. The goals of APEC are enshrined in the next um, next slide. And I'm showing you the three pillars. Um, the three pillars of uh, APEC is to um, promote free trade and uh, free trade and economic cooperation, facilitate the establishment of new markets, uh, and also aims to raise the living standards um, and education to foster a sense of community and an appreciation of shared interests. So. How do, how, do, how do they go about how do they go about this so first for example uh, free trade and economic cooperation through unilateral liberalization apec members voluntarily agree to liberalize a particular trade and investment area including tariffs non-tariff measures services investment standards and conformance customs procedures and intellectual property rights among others for uh, trade facilitation the the, the, the the community aims to do this by easing and lessening the cost of doing business in the region by facilitating more efficient standards and uh, customs and other procedures uh, relating to e-commerce, um, supporting business travel, supporting telecommunications, and even um, uh, ensuring um, government procurement is um, free. Um, what else? So, for example, for economic and technical cooperation, the collective actions of the um, APEC member countries to achieve its overall goals by attaining a sustainable growth and improving the social well-being in the region. So all these goals uh, are enshrined in the Bogor Goals in 1994. So, so uh, the APEC leaders first outlined the APEC vision of stability, security, and prosperity for our people when uh, the United States hosted in 1993. The vision evolved further during Indonesia's hosting in 1994 to free and open trade and investment in Asia Pacific by 2010 for industrialized economies and for and 2020 for developing economies. So you will see that we are now actually in the year when uh, we expect that the Bogor goals have been achieved. This vision would eventually be known as, as I've mentioned, the Bogor goals. This coincided with the Uruguay round of the multilateral trade negotiations conducted under the General Agreements on Tariffs and Trade, or the CAT, which APEC is, con is widely considered to have been significantly influential. But more importantly, just uh, recently, just last Friday, the Bogor goals has been succeeded by the APEC Putrajaya Vision 2040, which will chart the future of APEC for the next two decades. The leaders envision an open, dynamic, resilient, and peaceful Asia-Pacific community by 2000, by 2040 for the prosperity of all the people and future generations. So that's why um, the 2019 project on uh, the perspectives on, on uh, APEC was conducted in order to support uh, this um, exercise of what uh, APEC has achieved in and to um, provide the support in the visioning for, for the next uh, 20 years. All right, so given this, uh, in the next slide, you will see how APEC was envisioned in when, when, when it was started. So the structure of APEC is really a very, APEC is really a very simple, already see here in this slide, the, uh, 
the structure is quite simple. The leaders meeting is supported by the ministerial meeting and the senior officials meeting. And then there are three, um, and then there are uh, uh, some working groups uh, listed there uh, in support of the senior officials meeting to provide um, technical uh, uh, backstopping to the needs and of the senior officials. But after a few years, the you will see that the structure has now become very, very complicated. As you will see the leaders meeting again, um, the structure in 2020, the leaders meeting is still the, at the top. And it is, this is supported by the ministerial meeting and the senior officials meeting. But you will see there in the towards the bottom of there are so many working groups, so many and um, actually, this structure is cut. So the next slide also presents the next part of the structure. So there's actually, it's so large, we cannot even fit it into one slide. There are so many working groups and there are many sub fora. And this just represents the number of concerns and the number of commitments that's being discussed and that's relevant in APEC. So in the next slide, I am showing you uh, the number of commitments how the number of commitments have increased over time. The evolution of APEC can be seen in the increasing number of commitments and initiatives. Since APEC hosting is assigned to a different economy by year, the specific set of commitments and initiatives changes annually and it's based on the needs of the region at that time. The figure shows from 1996 to 2016, APEC commitments have increased from an average of about 11 in, in uh, the 1996, 97, 98, uh, to as many as uh, 64 uh, commitments in 2016. And these commitments cover a wide range of topics. It covers, for instance, general APEC goals, uh, of course, advancing free trade and investment, um, structural reform. There's also, it covers uh, topics related to supply chain connectivity, MSMEs, um, ICT, uh, of course, environment and climate change, uh, even uh, food and energy security. Of course, there's also some uh, working groups tackling uh, education, health, uh, supporting women and other um, poor and marginalized sectors. So as the as time goes on, the the number of issues and the number of uh, commitments have have increased. But what is, what has APEC achieved? So APEC has contributed to trade liberalization in the region, uh, and this is shown in the num in the two graphs that's uh, in in this slide. So for, from 2007 to 2017, the share of duty-free products increased from 40.1% to 47.9%, while the share of products with more than 10% MFN applied rates has declined from 18% to 13.1%. And that is shown in the panel um, on the left. On the right, it shows the trade liberalization is supported by the proliferation of FTAs in APEC. So before the 1990s, the total number of FTAs uh, entered by the Asia-Pacific economies was less than 10. By 2017, 2017 a total of uh, 175 agreements were signed by APEC economies. 164 of these FTAs are already in force, while 63 are, and also 63 are also intra-APEC FTAs, so among the, the 21 member uh, economies uh, of APEC. All right, um, in terms of exports and imports or in terms of total trade, we are seeing that APEC has reached um, 8.8 .8 trillion US dollars um, in terms of exports and imports have reached around 8.9 trillion in 2017. What we are seeing here is that there's, um, there's a slight decline since um, in, since uh, 2014, um, but we are seeing a recovery uh, and the, it's starting to pick up in 2017. Um, um, what is important here in this slide is that intra-APEC trade has accounted for about 70% of total trade of the APEC economies in the region. So most of the what who we are trading with are part of APEC. The, in ter the in terms of uh, investment, gross fixed capital formation, or uh, as a measure of investment in APEC, also grew from 1989 to 2016. 
from uh, three trillion US dollars in 1989, it has grown to 12.2 uh, trillion dollars in 2016. And the gross fixed capital formation or GFCF in developing economies has exceeded the, the ones from the industrialized countries starting in 2011. So we're also seeing a lot of support that's being given to those uh, industrializing, um, uh, developing uh, economies. Uh, investments were also observed to have improved in APEC in 2000 to 2017. The foreign direct inflows, uh, foreign direct investment inflows were estimated to be 57% of all world inflows, valued at um, 815 billion dollars in 2017. FDI outflows, on the other hand, comprise 65.5% of total world outflows, valued at 936.6 billion. And as can be seen in, can be seen in the figure on the right. All right, so, all right, so um, trade investment needs to be translated into development goals. So what is happening in terms of poverty in the region? So poverty in APEC has been declining. Uh, as you can see here in this slide, uh, poverty in APEC seems to have improved as well. From 1.5 billion people in APEC living in poor to extremely poor, only about 475.2 million lived in poverty in 2013. Those considered near poor or people living um, above the poverty line and vulnerable to returning to poverty had risen from 241.1 million to 720.3 million. But these are the ones that have been moved out of um, extreme poor. So now they're no longer extreme poor, but they are still um, vulnerable and um, returning to poverty. So these are the ones that we need to also uh, support. All right. Then let's uh, talk about the Philippines. What has the Philippines been doing in APEC and what, how uh, APEC has been uh, supporting uh, the, the Philippines? Or... So APEC, which operates on the basis of non-binding and voluntary commitment and open dialogue, is important to the Philippines for a number of reasons. Majority of the country's external trade from APEC economies uh, external trade are from APEC member economies. It exports to APEC uh, around uh, 47,000 US dollars or 84.1% of its total exports and 51.6 of these are electronic products and the rest are wood crafts and furniture. Um, it's important from APEC economies on the other hand, uh, it's reached a total number of um, uh, 67,000 uh, billion um, US dollars of, in terms of total imports, which includes um, electronic products, transport equipment, and mineral fuels. So let's just stay here on this slide first uh, and look at look at the Philippine trade. So we can we are comparing here. If we're only looking at uh, exports with the ASEAN seven, that's um, around um, ten billion US dollars. But if we add the um, Philippine um, ex exports of to APEC, that's um, 56 um, billion US dollars, which is almost um, comparable to what we are trading with the rest of the world, not counting APEC. So the trend is really with, if we are going to look at how much we are trading with, uh, with APEC, it's really the major partners are really those belonging to the region, to APEC. And it's the same trend if we were going to look at it in terms of imports. Um, uh, total imports for our APEC are around 101.9 billion. And this is um, comparable to how much we are trading with the rest of the world. So that the entire region is actually um, about half of, of um, what we are um, trading or more than half of what we are trading. Or are important. In terms of uh, Philippine investment, um, the top FDI partners are actually the ones um, from APEC. Uh, for in, for instance, Japan, Japan, Taiwan, uh, Singapore, United States. Um, these are member um, APEC mem member uh, economies. 
So of the top top seven investing economies, six of these are APEC economies and it's led by Japan that contributed more than 30% in investment to the country. Uh, so in, in terms of the top seven, uh, six are led by um, by APEC, only the, only the United Kingdom is the one that's not part of APEC. The others uh, comprising the top seven are Australia and South Korea. Then in terms of, in terms of the who is visiting the, the Philippines, it's also people come from within the region. So, so most significant visitors are from South Korea, China, the US, and Japan. So all APEC member countries. Of the 25 countries, 15 of these, of the top 25 countries who are uh, visiting the Philippines, 15 of these are APEC, of which South Korea was the top. Uh, and this is equivalent, um, the number of uh, Koreans visiting the country in 2018 is around uh, 1.2 million and equivalent to almost a quarter of the total visits of tourists from January to September in 2018. So these are, um, uh, are um, what or how much APEC is important to the Philippines in terms of trade, the, in terms of investment, and in terms of tourism. So what is the, the Philippines doing? So some of the initiatives of the Philippines to APEC would include these three, so the Philippines uh, initiatives to the F FTAAP. So first one would be the Manila Action Plan for APEC in 1996, which integrates the individual action plans, um, collective uh, action plans and progress reports on joint uh, activities of APEC members and the various APEC fora. So this uh, Manila Action Plan um, is actually a, a compiling compilation uh, in fulfilling the voluntary commitments that has been made in the Osaka Action Agenda uh, towards the achievement of the Pogor goals. And then when we hosted in 2015 the Cebu Action Plan with the goal of building an APEC community that is more financially integrated, transparent, resilient, and connected, the roadmap seeks to promote um, policies, rules, and practices across APEC economies to support strong, sustainable, inclusive, and balanced growth throughout the region. So um, there are four pillars in the uh, Cebu Action Plan. And then next would be the Boracay uh, Action Agenda to the Globalize MSMEs, which, are, which is also uh, an initiative of the Philippines um, that was uh, started in uh, when we hosted in 2015. There are actually the, these pillars, um, trade facilitation, financing, digital economy, uh, institutional support, and women, women in MSMEs. So uh, other, um, other Philippine initiatives that's related to the FDAAP is already shown in this slide. Um, so that would, um, some of the initiatives are related, are related to improving the supply chain connectivity and the green supply chain. And as I have mentioned, the Boracay Action Agenda. So let me just go through all of these uh, very quickly. For instance, um, on supply chain connectivity, having identified uh, different cho choke points in the supply chain connectivity, the Philippines conducted its own activities in order to overcome these challenges. Um, the, so for instance, in looking at the four major choke points like transparency, infrastructure, um, documentation, and connectivity, and uh, some of the actions are presented here in this table. For instance, um, to address uh, transparency, there was an initiative to advance the action plan for choke point one of the APEC supply chain connectivity framework. There was also a compendium of best practices of national logistic associations across the region. Uh, to support, for instance, uh, infrastructure, there was a study and seminar on energy transport and environmental benefits of transit-oriented development to support uh, the um, connectivity, to address the issues of connectivity choke points. Uh, there was um, the action, uh, for instance, providing training in management of security, safety, and emerging uh, technology in intermodal transportation and supply chain systems. So all of these um, uh, actions are of the Philippines uh, aim to support the supply chain and address the choke points identified in the supply chain connectivity framework action plan. All right, and then um, let's look at, for instance, um, the green supply chain, another uh, initiative. The Philippines initiated the discussion towards greening the MSMEs. 
during the dialogue on APEC cooperation network on green supply chains um, when we hosted in uh, the Boracay 2015. So the Philippines then had an ongoing project, the Greening Industry Roadmap, that aimed to identify policies that would enable industries to improve their competitiveness and capacitate them to participate in supply chains. More importantly, it should be cleaner and more efficient. So it's not just um, participating in global supply chains, but we want to make it um, more sustainable, cleaner, and more efficient. All right, and then the next one. Um, this is a very another very important topic about supporting the Boracay Action, Action Agenda to support the MSMEs. So as I mentioned, there are actually uh, five um, focus areas, uh, trade facilitation, providing uh, credit and financing, uh, supporting the digital economy for the MSMEs and uh, providing institutional support and supporting the um, women participation in MSMEs. And all of these uh, have their own, their very specific priorities as uh, shown here in, in this table. Now, when we were writing this paper um, and towards the end of 2019, uh, or we were looking at the, the number of projects and initiatives that were uh, conducted or held under, held under the BAA uh, priorities. And we found that there are around 115 um, projects uh, under these priority areas, seven to six of which have been completed at that time and uh, 39 are ongoing. I, I'm probably by now uh, almost all have been completed. And the member economies uh, concentrate on the internationalization and institutional support of um, the MSMEs. But there are also a lot of projects that are looking at supporting the participation of women at MSMEs as they recognize that the participation of women in MSMEs are important to support their economy. All right, so the next one, uh, Philippine Customs Procedure. So since the 2005 um, Individual Action Plan Review, the Philippines has intensified the simplification and harmonization of customs procedures to facilitate international trade and increase transparency. The Philippines has also participated in the ASEAN single window and initiated the national single window. I think now we were the last, uh, but now we have um, finally uh, signed the participation to the ASEAN single window agreement. Uh, the Philippines national single window is a computerized uh, internet-based system that allows trade parties to lodge information and documents with a single entry point and to comply to regulatory requirements, so thereby simplifying almost all the procedures that's related to customs. In 2017, the National Single Window Steering Committee, chaired by the Secretary of the Department of Finance, agreed to adopt a government-built platform, the tradenet.gov.ph, to serve as the vehicle for the National Single Window, aimed to facilitate trade, heighten transparency in customs procedures, and improve the revenue collection. TradeNet is expected to shorten the processing time, reduce the number of transaction documents, and remove bureaucratic red tape. It would also connect uh, 66 agencies and 10 economic zones in the country, thereby um, making, making the, the processes uh, easier. All right, and then the Philippine and then initiatives on the Philippines on the ease of achieving uh, regional economic integration, which is the, tar the goal of uh, APEC, was through making trade cheaper, easier, and faster. The ease of doing business action plan was launched in 2009 and was expected to improve doing business in the region by 11.3% across all areas. The second uh, APEC's ease of doing business action plan is the continuation of the initiative launched in 2009. And Apex Ease of Doing Business is based on World Bank's do, uh, Doing Business Program and focuses on five uh, priority areas, uh, starting a business, dealing with construction permits, getting credit, trading across borders, and enforcing contracts. The over overall target of the first uh, Apex EODB uh, plan for 2009-2015 was to achieve an overall target of a 25% uh, um, improvement. Um, but I think um, the an assessment of that at the time was that uh, APEC fell short, um, but there are uh, stark improvements in 
um, across uh, a number of economies. For the Philippines, the we have actually improved by around 35 notches from 2010 to 2017. And a lot of this has been um, the initiatives that we have been doing in the country related to um, making uh, uh, doing business more efficient. For instance, the Republic Act um, 11032 simplifies and harmonizes systems and procedures by reducing processing time, eliminating red tape and corrupt practices, or which uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with is the anti-red tape um, and creating the anti-red tape authority or the anti-red tape act. So there's the Philippines has also an um, initiatives uh, related to the business one-stop shops, uh, unifying business application procedures for securing licenses, um, clearance permits, and certificates. I'm sorry, I think I've moved already. Uh, let me just go back uh, one slide. Uh, and then, uh, then um, another initiative would be related to the Philippine Business Data Bank which is, was created to provide agencies and government units access to data and information that can be used to verify the validity and existence of businesses to avoid resubmission of the same documentary requirements. And I think this is also very important because we don't want to keep on asking for the same documentary requirements again and again for uh, the current purpose when we've already asked these from business applicants. So all of these have been um, initiatives of the Philippines to support uh, ease of doing business, which was, um, again, also a part of a regional integration goals of APEC. Finally, we look at the Philippine initiatives related to um, RACER or, or the renewed APEC agenda for structural reform. Structural reform is another initiative within APEC that supports economies to progress even in times of economic slowdown. Initially, it was intended to prevent slower growth, but now it helps economies leverage improved efficiency and competitiveness. There's actually um, uh, three pillars. The, um, uh, okay, so let me just provide a background. So in 2015, RAZOR was proposed by APEX uh, structural reform ministers, and there are actually three pillars that serve as a um, guide to the individual economies. So these would include um, more open, well-functioning, transparent, and competitive markets, deeper participation in those markets by all segments. Um, of course, um, when we say all segments, that would include the MSMEs, women, youth, uh, older workers, and even people with disabilities. Uh, and then the third one would be uh, sustainable social policies that promote the above um, mentioned objectives but also enhance economic resilience as well as well-targeted, effective, and um, making it non-discriminatory. Of course, uh, well, you know, the, all the, these initiatives are non-prescriptive and uh, provide economies independence in the, their reform uh, priorities. So what the Philippines did was it, it identified um, uh, six, six um, individual action plans that address the, the, the three pillars uh, of um, of uh, the razor and uh, those are presented here. So improving the efficiency of the logistics sector, um, provide, um, improving access of MSMEs to financial services for pillar two, and for pillar three with promoting skills development opportunities. All right, so at this time, let me just um, provide you some uh, takeaways. So APEC has the, um, when when uh, I didn't go through the entire history of APEC, but really what we see here is that APEC balances the geopolitics in the region. So you know, we saw that the members uh, are are the uh, highly developed uh, the economies like Japan, the Yuan, the U.S. But we also see here that there are some um, developing co economies like the Philippines, uh, Vietnam, Indonesia. And then uh, Papua New Guinea is also uh, a member. And there is a balance in terms of um, the way the economies are cooperating. And it's a new approach to regional uh, economic integration. And um, But we also see that there are more um, uh, efforts that are required to meeting its commitments. So despite what APEC has achieved, it remains um, 
limited in its effectiveness in some of the areas. For instance, in the Philippines, more efforts are required to significantly make progress in leaders in this meeting in some of the commitments to the Booker goals. But the achievements can be realized through, again, strengthening and participating more in the negotiations, enacting more efficient, effective guidance on trade and investment. Uh, some, uh, as I've mentioned, some of um, criticize APEC because of the non-binding and the voluntary principles of APEC. However, it's the non-institutionalization suggests that there's uh, some degree of flexibility that promotes our in the um, promotes regional integration. So with diverse and highly dynamic economies in the region, APEC provides a flexible liberalization and facilitation process to stabilize the, the deepening markets. So if in the next slide, APEC has also contributed in shaping the business environment of the Philippines. Um, um, as there's still plenty remains to be done, especially in the view of the challenges in expanding um, economic opportunities in industry and services. And to, uh, it's important for the Philippines to um, utilize trade agreements and trade facilitation uh, to upgrade uh, domestic facilities to meet global standards and to align um, its uh, domestic regulations. So, all right. So at this point, uh, let me just uh, go through very quickly of uh, what uh, APEC has uh, perceived um, or how is APEC perceived by its stakeholders. So um, this study, the next study, that uh, is based on a an earlier study by CR, Albert and Lianto, who, who did an assessment on the perception on ASEAN. But uh, this time we're looking at a perception on APEC. So uh, uh, there are, we sent out a questionnaire consisting of uh, around 25 questions and uh, talking, uh, looking at um, uh, a number of uh, issues and related to um, what's the goal of, um, of whether APEC has retreated achieved its targets and what do you think are the issues that do you think are the issues that are relevant for APEC in the next few years. So let me just go, I have um, eight points here very quickly. So the first one is that uh, respondents um, from NCR noticeably rate trade liberalization goals with higher mean scores. So it's uh, suggesting that APEC efforts are more felt in NCR than the rest of the country. The instances were both groups agree is regarding their perception and APEC's efforts to reduce tariff rates and reducing tariffs on APEC listed environmental goods, which both groups gave a mean score of about 3.3, suggesting again reduced tariffs is felt across all the country. Next, number two, um, government and non-government respondents agree that APEC has done an acceptable effort, but can do more to promote regional economic integration. So while government agencies, so while government trade liberalization goals higher than non-government institutions, the two groups do agree that their perception about APEX efforts in promoting regional economic integration. So they agree that both groups rated this goal with a mean score of about 3.4 percent, uh, 3.4 score, and uh, the highest across all goals. In 2010, APEC leaders reaffirmed their commitment. Uh, okay, so maybe in the interest of time, let me just uh, move to the next uh, uh, point. So NCR and non-NCR respondents perceive APEX regional connectivity and efficiency goals similarly. Again, comparing the perspectives from of those from NCR and uh, non-NCR. So NCR respondents mean scores are generally at least as high as non-NCR respondents which suggests that APEX efforts towards uh, regional connectivity and fostering efficiency are felt similarly across the country. However, a noticeable difference is reported for the goals of improving the ease of doing business and improving transparency, competition, and markets. Both groups also agree that APEC has done an acceptable job in strengthening people mobility, institutional ties, and networks in the region, which both gave their highest score of about 3.2. Uh, again, this is out of four. No? So, so that's a, a high score. So non-government institutions, solutions number four, perceive that APEC has done little towards reducing customs waiting time. And this is, I think, a, a contentious one. 
So not so the goal of reducing customs waiting time received a mean score about 2.4, a, a bit uh, low, which signals that the non-government institutions perceive APEC not doing very little or little or influencing having little influence to the achievement of this goal. However, if we do look at the what state um, the reports have been telling us. APEC did make um, customs procedures faster. At the border, for instance, APEC economies have centralized export-import processes online, accelerating the time it takes for goods to travel across borders. In fact, um, APEC established the, the virtual system, as, the, the, as I mentioned earlier, the single window that links all government uh, agencies uh, involved in import um, export-import processes, thus allowing companies to submit documents electronically so although of course in the philippines the the national single window um uh, the philippines is participating through the national single window which is a computerized internet-based system that allows uh, trade parties to lodge information and documents so but still i think that the important thing here to remember is that the perception perception is that there's little improvement or little has been done so but there's uh, some achievement that's uh, already going on. All right. Then moving very quickly in the number five, non-NCR respondents perceived APEX efforts toward addressing emerging issues poorly compared to NCR respondents. Again, the those uh, outside of NCR um, have a different view from those uh, in NCR. So NCR respondents gave remarkably higher scores than non-NCR respondents. So in addition, non-NCR respondents perceive that APEC has done little towards encouraging the development of clean technologies, supporting energy efficiency and renewable energy, and for the developing the, and for developing green towns. However, again, in reality, APEC has done much towards environmental sustainability. So the green APEC green towns were actually funded by a multi-year project, the APEC Energy Working Group. Uh, five more minutes. And these cities are reducing their carbon footprint. So there's actually a lot that's um, achieved uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, APEC, in terms of this. So let me, um, the rest uh, are, are, again, uh, so I have three more. So let me just go very quickly again. Um, so another point that we saw from the survey is that both governments and non-government institutions agree that APEC has done little towards uh, the development of green towns. Uh, again, uh, that has been a uh, result in the earlier um, slide. Also, um, all stakeholders groups, groups are optimistic that APEC can realize a digital connected region after 2020. So there's a positive side on that, but pessimistic on environmental conservation and sustainability. So. Uh, I guess there's uh, a lot of activity that has been done through the APEC Internet and Digital Economy Roadmap adopted in 2017. So more people are aware of the digitally connected region by 2020, but very little has, um, there's a pessimism in terms of um, environmental conservation and sustainability. And finally, um, services are very important. So a, a, lot, a lot of the stakeholders express that services need more prioritization that is uh, afforded to them at present. So I have um, uh, seven takeaways, but let me just um, go to the last, um, I actually have eight, and let me just go to slide 42. Um, number seven, I think is uh, important. So stakeholders are optimistic. Uh, again, uh, as I've mentioned, um, this is related to the environmental conservation in the region uh, but but let me this point is actually referring to the apec putrajaya's vision of 2040 which enshrined digitization um, offers support to stakeholders optimism towards the digitally integrated apec but the same vision also mentioned apec's commitment to comprehensively address environmental challenges for a sustainable planet which can send some assurance that the environmental conservation and sustainability are in apex uh, paradigm. And then uh, again, uh, as I mentioned, uh, services trade, which I think are very more relevant, are more relevant now, especially if it's related to health, could grow stronger in the region. So digitalization could foster more growth for services and could even give rise 
given rise to completely new services that have been non-existent before, especially yes. as it has been needed by uh, to support the the strategies that we are doing um, to address the pandemic. So um, apologies for um, going over time, but uh, these are the, the things that I want to present and I welcome your questions later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Francis Kimba. Um, we will have time to go over your other uh, takeaways. I think those are um, important too. Uh, there may be questions related to those um, takeaways during the open forum. Uh, friends, uh, let us now listen uh, to the um, to um, the uh, comments of our discussants. So we invited uh, two trade and diplomacy experts to give their comments on the study's findings and recommendations and the insights of the agency that we are representing. We will hear first from um, our uh, trade and industry department, which is being represented today by Ms. Marie Sherilyn Delenia Akia. Ms. Akia is the Chief of the Multilateral Relations Division of the Bureau of, Inter Bureau of International Trade Relations of the Department of Trade and Industry where uh, she heads the APEC and WTO desk. She was CTI's coordinator for substantive issues during the APEC 2015 chairmanship of the Philippines and was also the chairperson of the APEC Committee on Trade and Investments in 2016 and 2017. She obtained her uh, bachelor's degree uh, from the University of the Philippines in Diliman and has master's credits and has earned master's credits from the Ateneo de Manila University and Boston University. Friends, Ms. Uh, Marie Sherilyn Akia. Ms. Akia? Thank you, uh, Dr. Sear, for that uh, introduction. Good afternoon to everyone, to all our distinguished guests, our colleagues in government and the private sector and academe, our Tibam colleagues, I see a lot of them here uh, in the participants. List. Also, I note some participants from all over the country. It's a pleasure to be in this webinar. Thank you very much to Dr. Celia Reyes and Dr. Francis Kimba and our hardworking colleagues at CIDS for organizing this webinar. I also want to say hi to Assistant Secretary Eric and his team at the National Secretariat and congratulations uh, for a very successful APEC 2020. The PIDS is an important partner of the DTI, and we are always appreciative of their support to our work at the Bureau, and um, not just the Bureau, but also the, the DTI in general. And this is not just in AXEC, but also in our other engagements. I was asked to comment on the study's findings and recommendations, and I was also asked to share the DTI's efforts and initiatives to improve the Philippines trade and investment linkages and policy coordination with other APEC member economies. So let me start with the last one, with this note, which is on the Philippines trade and investment profile with APEC and our levels of engagement with its members. Let's go to the first slide. Dr. Kimba's study already showed us how important APEC is to the Philippines in terms of trade and investment. And in this slide, uh, this is just like a summary of, of what he has in the study and what he has presented. And I'd like to recall the APEX mission, which is to support sustainable economic growth and prosperity in the Asia Pacific region, mainly through trade and investment liberalization and facilitation and economic and technical cooperation. So this has been APEX mantra up until this year as, as Many of you have heard already, we will have a new vision for 2040, uh, the Putrajaya Vision 2040. And well, just going back to the, the old mission vision, this harks to Apex roots or history when 12 countries banded together in response to the increasing interdependence of Asia Pacific economies. And some who are very familiar with the Apex history would also say it was also a response by Australia uh, on their growing uh, and their growing concern on the proliferation of regional blocks that time or FTAs such as the uh, EU and also the, the uh, then what was called the NAFTA. But as a group, APEC remains a powerhouse for trade and investment. 
So on this slide, you'll see uh, views from 2018 data. APEC economies as a whole accounted for 48% of global trade in merchandise goods and commercial services. Majority of Philippines economic and commercial transactions around the world, as we heard earlier, they take place with the rest of APEC member economies. Um, uh, Dr. Francis mentioned also um, that most of our major trading partners are APEC members. So out of the top 15 uh, trading partners, 11 are from APEC. And then on uh, in terms of uh, 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 total trade of the Philippines, APEC accounts for 84% of our trade. And this number is rising. In fact, we have data from September 2020, which uh, showed that majority of Philippine merchandise exports went to the APEC market, uh, around 86%. So, so that's at least 2% rise from 84%. And for the first half of 2019, about 77% of the Philippines total approved foreign investments came from APEC economies. So the trade and investment profile of APEC is really significant. And this is the reason why we continue to be very engaged at DPI in APEC. Okay. We'll go to the next slide. So our engagement or how we manage our relationship with APEC and APEC economies can be characterized in three levels. And this slide shows the three levels of engagement, multilateral, regional, and bilateral. At the multilateral level, uh, we engage with the APEC through the World Trade Organization. All APEC members are, all APEC economies are WTO members. So you see uh, in red, uh, that's how many WTO members are, 154, 21, including the Philippines, they're all members. There is a strong history in APEC of supporting the multilateral trading system, the GATT, and the WTO. In fact, the Bogor Goals and the Osaka Action Agenda, these were mechanisms to support the Uruguay round when the when the GATT negotiations face a deadlock. And eventually, APEC adopted a non-traditional approach, or uh, we heard it from Dr. Francis, it's a voluntary, non-binding approach to liberalization. And so far, this engagement with uh, at the multilateral level at the WTO has been quite productive. The information technology agreement, one of the plurilateral agreements that was what was born out of an APEC ministerial meeting. We also have the trade facilitation agreement, uh, which is the first WTO multilateral agreement negotiated after the Uruguay round and the first agreement since WTO was established. So the negotiations for the TFA are was pushed by APEC trade ministers. There is really a lot of discussion of WTO issues in APEC meetings. Different delegations use APEC as a venue to get support for WTO proposal. And we have the example of the US who led the work on the, on the ITA uh, and also on the TFA. We also have the likes of Japan, Singapore, Australia, who are uh, currently pushing for the negotiations on e-commerce uh, in the WTO. Later, I will relate how we were able to bring our work in APEC to the WTO. We also are doing our own advocacy. At the second level is the regional, and this is mainly done through our participation in ASEAN. For ASEAN FTA, we have seven FTAs, the internal or the AFTA FTA. Uh, uh, our FTA, ASEAN is a group with Japan, China, Korea, Australia, and Hong Kong. Uh, the Hong Kong entered into force uh, just last year. The only ASEAN FTA that we have with a non-APEC member is in, is with India. And then we have, uh, under discussions now, we have ASEAN Canada, uh, very preliminary discussions, still in very early stages. And then ASEAN also has dialogue partners. Uh, there, there are 10 dialogue partners, out of which are eight, uh, eight are APEC members. So we have Australia, Canada, China, Japan, Korea, New Zealand, Russia and the US. So the two non-APEC are India and the EU. And then of course we heard the RCEP, which is the one mega FTA under the regional umbrella, or at least at, under ASEAN. Uh, it was signed this month, 12 out of the 15 parties of RCEP are APEC economies. So we're really very engaged with our APEC partners in ASEAN. Both APEC and ASEAN share a common goal of economic integration, and there are strong synergies on many is issues such as uh, micro and SMEs or MISMIs, as we say it, 
supply chain connectivity, single window, standards and conformance, the health, communicable disease and disaster management. APEX issues also often find their way to ASEAN, such as discussions on regulatory cooperation, services, domestic regulations, business travel card, and vice versa. RSF, when it was going through its negotiations, also drew many of its ideas from APEX, such as on regulatory cooperation and on e-commerce. Um, some partners were testing their ideas in APEX before ne negotiating the binding rules in RSF. And as eventually APEC will benefit from RCEP since RCEP is one of the pathways to the free trade area of the Asia Pacific, so the FTAP. This is the big sister, I would say the big sister of the mega regional, which will um, combine the CPTPP and the RCEP and the EAU and USMCA. So we also have in APEC an APEC ASEAN cost caucus where we try to speak as one voice and support each other's initiatives. Okay, so that's at the regional level. And then lastly, but most important and more granular, granular engagement is at the bilateral level. We have, uh, I listed it for FTAs, both concluded and under negotiation. Two of these FTAs are with APEC. So we have Japan, which is concluded, and one which is currently underway with South Korea. Our target is to conclude the negotiations this year. We also have 31 joint economic cooperation agreements in place. JECs, as you call them, are important mechanisms to discuss economic and trade and investment promotion, cooperation, and business environment issues. We have JECs with the smallest to the biggest APEC member economies. We signed a, a JEC, a, a MOU with PNG in 2017 when they hosted APEC. Uh, we will be signing one with Chile this year. Uh, many of the JECs are active such as uh, in Indonesia, I think we signed an investment MOU with them this year. We also have the TIFAR, the Trade Investment Framework Agreement with the United States. Under the TIFA, we signed a Trade Facilitation and Customs, Pro uh, Customs Protocol Agreement when they hosted in 20, 2011. So there's only a handful of a APEC economies that we don't have check checks with. I think Peru and if I'm not mistaken, Mexico, we don't have a check with them yet. Then there's also the GSP or the Generalized System of Preferences. These are trade preference programs wherein our products enjoy duty-free access in the GSP host market. Four of the existing GSPs that we enjoy, uh, three are with APEC members. So that's the US, uh, one with Canada, and another is the EAU or the Eurasian Economic Union. This is the, the customs union led by Russia with other uh, Eastern European, Western, and North Asian uh, countries. So uh, here, I did not list here uh, uh, the CPTPP. We started to join the TPP, then that it was the TPP. And our interest uh, was really mainly because of the projected non-participation to the TPP and possible loss of market share to TPP countries that produce the same products and offer the same services are. So that uh, would go through to Vietnam and Malaysia. However, uh, the U.S. withdrew from the TPP, so the cost of non-participation has lessened, but we're still interested, still looking at the TPP. And we still, of course, continue to engage, uh, enjoy market access, uh, preferential access to the U.S. market, since we're a beneficiary of the U.S. GSP system. And really our interest uh, into joining TPP was to lock in, or at least to have an FTA with the US, is to lock in all the commitments under the GSP program. Because it's, it's the GSP program, it's really not the commitment. Let's go to the last slide. It was really very hard to comment on the recommendations on the and the conclusions of uh, Dr. Kimba's studies. And because uh, we think that he did a very good and comprehensive analysis. Just at the out that we would support the recommendations from these studies. The results of the perception survey, they're very in interesting. And in a way, I would personally expect them. I would guess that if we had not hosted in 2015, the results would be probably less encouraging in terms of people's knowledge of APEC and its issues. However, we see this uh, the recommendations, these are pointers for us in, DT, in DTI. 
And I think if we are able to address at least half the recommendations, we would be able to maximize and benefit even more from our participation in, a in APEC. Just by way of providing comments, I uh, just want to point out and highlight some issues which are important for us and also to explain why it's important for us to engage in APEC and why we say that uh, the recommendations really deserve our attention. Uh, firstly, a uh, APEC is a vehicle to support domestic reform. So APEC is very business and market oriented. Free trade, open trade, that's really the mantra. Fair trade as of late. And uh, lately, it has also responded to a more holistic approach to development. And to the extent that we see trade as a tool for development, we will always be open to ideas in APEC, especially to learn from other economies in order to drive productivity and to build competitive industries. Second, the APEC principles and priorities confirm the appropriateness of uh, domestic reforms being, under, being undertaken. It, it is an incubator and a testing ground for Philippine policies and for Philippine advocacy. So I listed there uh, Meet Me, Services, Trade and Trade Facilitation, and Dr. Kimba men mentioned ease of doing business that uh, really benefited from the seminars in APEC and discussion. The Miss Me Advocacy is a success story. The Boracay Action Agenda was adopted in 2016 in May during the Trade Minister's meeting, and it was one of the Philippines' priorities at the time. And in that year, in October, the, uh, our then Secretary uh, Domingo, uh, Greg Domingo, joined the public forum in the WTO to encourage members to make Miss Me the front and center of, w of the WTO agenda. We started the discussions in Boracay in APEC. And then we brought it to the WTO. And this has led to the establishment of a Friends of Miss Me in the WTO and eventually an informal working group on Miss Me. And this year in December, we are hopeful that the WTO General Council will adopt a package of Miss Me deliverables to assist in the development and integration in cross border trade of a very important sector of our economy. So there's other stories aside from Miss Me. There's also our work with customs. Uh, how we were able to uh, agree on a de minimis rate of $100 or 10,000 pesos for a uh, short uh, expedited shipment. And sorry, not short, for uh, expedited shipment. Then our work on advanced rulings, on single window, on the a, uh, authorized economic operator. So it's a lot on the customs area. I just would like to clarify that the, just going, going back to the Barakai Action Agenda, just uh, I need to clarify that this it's not under the free trade area of the Asia Pacific uh, uh, discussion. Uh, the objectives of B, uh, of BAA are different. We did not design it for the BAA. If the B uh, for the FTAP, if BAA objectives are achieved, it will feed into the free trade area of the Asia Pacific in the sense that we will have competitive and global misdeeds. Um, but the BAA was really the DTI's answer to inclusive growth. And uh, green supply chain was, uh, this is an initiative led by China. It, it was one of the initiatives that support the implementation of the Boracay Action Agenda. And um, there, there were many other initiatives that were born out of the BAA. I would say you, the women's uh, agenda, or La Serena Roadmap, that was uh, championed by Chile last year. That's also one of our, uh, I would say, a baby of the BAA. So, uh, overall, we had 285 initiatives, so that's it's not 132, Dr. Francis. Now it's 285. That's how many initiatives that were developed uh, just from uh, the Boracay Action Agenda. So next point number three is on technical cooperation and capacity building. That they are always useful, and I know not a lot of us here who are listening in they have attended one or two seminars in APEC. These are always useful. At DTI, when we form out the invitations, we always hope and trust that our uh, partner agencies will send the correct uh, personnel, the right people who will benefit from these uh, seminars. Um, sometimes they send the right people, sometimes not. Um, so that, that's beyond our, our, our scope. The DTI, though, is always doing its best to get projects funded and because this is one way to benefit from the membership dues that we pay. Um, Ecotech, or Economic and Technical Cooperation, is our gift to APEC in 1996. And this is an area we need to con continually work on. 
we need to expand doing projects not just with agencies but with the academia and also the business sector. Okay. Next point is um, the new digital format provides an opportunity for wider participation. So when COVID struck and all our international meetings were moved to a virtual format, we found an opportunity to share the trainings and the meetings to as many government agencies and stakeholders. And we are still trying to find ways to bring as many participants to our meetings. Post-COVID, we hope that we will be able to continue this digital format. Fifth point, there's always room for improvement. Uh, we need to cooperate, communicate, and collaborate. Thinking uh, collaboration that was emphasized by Dr. Kimpa. We have close ties with the business and the academe. That is a unique character of APAC, uh, both at the domestic level and the regional level. There's really not a lot of international organizations who have institutionalized partnership with business and the academia the way APEC has done it very successfully. Internally, we meet with APEC Philippines at least once a quarter. We hope that we can meet more often with them at a technical level. We also hope that we can engage with APEC Study Center Consortium, especially uh, with the IDS and the consortium more often. In terms of communicating at, uh, at, our, at the Bureau, we often refer to our APEC work in the drafting of new legislation and in assisting our trade negotiators. So we really make full use of everything that we get from APEC. We also try to use the social media to share the useful studies and the initiatives of APEC. And some of the APEC studies and uh, PECC studies are featured in our, or will be featured in the BITR Facebook. But I think we need to do more. How bad are we on communication? Uh, in the survey, not many people associated uh, APEC with environment and sustainable growth. And not many people know that APEC economies did the first tariff cutting exercise on environmental goods ahead of any FTA or, or even the WTO. So this is a win for green growth. So not many people know that. Okay. Anyway, we will continue to seek to collaborate with the private sector and academia. PIDS, by the way, is our knowledge partner for the final review of the Boracay Action Agenda implementation. And uh, PA has served for a uh, framework uh, for five years on uh, empowering our MISMIS. And as we end its um, implementation, PPI will give more focus on MISMIS competitiveness in the digital economy. And then regionally in APEC, PPI also we lead the work on the APEC Trade Repository, which is a portal of trade-related information. We want to cooperate not just on trade and investment, but, but also on other issues that will support economic growth and social development. Um, six point, APEC strength lies in its non-binding strength. I heard this from Dr. Kimba also, and I will end my remarks by going back to where I started. Actually, I wanted to really say and emphasize that we use APEC to support domestic reforms. I wanted to say when I was drafting this PowerPoint uh, to, to put lock in the reforms, but locking in reforms more in the area of uh, free trade agreements and WTO, that it is the uh, more binding side of our work. Uh, but however, at this time, we have observed some perceptions against uh, free trade uh, agreements and generally on big institutions, sometimes the government. And we have been questioned really on how trade agreements are negotiated, uh, the secrecy and all, uh, but that is part and parcel of our job. From um, my perspective, having worked in APEC for a long time and also having done binding work uh, on the WTO and also on the ASEAN Japan, my previous uh, assignments, APEC's non binding nature provides a safe space in the policy area. APEC gives us the flexibility to move around, to pick and choose, and prioritize our areas of, inter of interest. It is also easier for us to come on board on many issues, not uh, um, because it is non-binding. So there, uh, really, APEC has given us a voice. It has gone a long way. It used to be that the big economies were driving the agenda of APEC. I'm not saying that's not the case anymore. It, it still is, but APEC has also evolved, and we in the Philippines have helped shape its agenda. The MISMI advocacy in 2015 was only part of a bigger inclusive growth agenda that was one of our major contributions to APEC. We championed inclusive growth in 2015, and, uh, and that has been the underlying theme in many host years from 2016 2020, and finally, it has found a space in the Putrajaya Vision 2040. 
So we could say that we have benefited from APAC and we have also made our contribution. So let me end with that. And thank you once again to Dr. Kimba for the studies and to CIDS for organizing the seminar. Then thank you, um, Ms. Akia. We'll hear more from you during the open forum. Um, thank you for those uh, thought-provoking um, comments as well as your, uh, we're, we're glad to know about the um, initiatives of the BTI. And uh, we'll also, uh, also uh, take note of uh, your candid assessment of what still needs to be done. Okay, moving on. Well, now let us hear uh, the comments of our Foreign Affairs Department, which is being represented today by Assistant Secretary Erika Tamayo. Asik Tamayo is a career uh, minister of the Philippine uh, Foreign Service uh, currently assigned to the Office of the Undersecretary for International Economic Relations. He has a number of foreign postings, uh, which include being a uh, Minister and Consul General of the Philippine Embassy in Ottawa in Canada. And he also served as Sir uh, J.B. Affair ad interim of the Embassy. He was also assigned to the Philippine Embassy in Tokyo, Japan as Principal Assistant at the Office of the Secretary and eventually designated Head of the Economic uh, Diplomacy Unit when carrying a special assistant to the Secretary of Foreign Affairs. He also served as a Philippine alternate representative to various UN bodies, uh, such as the International Civil Aviation Organization and the Convention on Biological Diversity. He has a master's degree in international affairs and relations from the Fletcher School of Law and uh, Diplomacy at Tufts University and a bachelor's degree in economics from the University of the Philippines School of Economics. Aside from his ex exemplary work experience and education, he has trained on WTO trade negotiations and on economic diplomacy. Friends, Assistant Secretary Eric Tamayo. Sir? Thank you uh, so much, uh, Dr. Siar, uh, for that kind introduction. And uh, if I may uh, uh, proceed straight away, uh, Dr. Celia Reyes, distinguished guests and dignitaries from the different branches of uh, government fellow panelists, colleagues in government and in the service, ladies and gentlemen. I am pleased to join all of you this afternoon as I extend our thanks and appreciation to all who are present for your help and support in ensuring a successful conclusion of the APEC 2020 um, meetings hosted by Malaysia. And I share uh, Lynn's sentiments in conveying our relief and delight at the outcomes of APEC this year. And uh, certainly Lynn brought with her uh, her extensive experience in APEC uh, uh, in the run-up run to the uh, uh, conclusion of the APEC leaders this year. I extend my congratulations to PIDS for organizing this board today and to Dr. Kimba and to also to Mark Baral for their paper on the evolution of APEC and its role in Philippine trade and investment. And I also thank uh, Dr. Francis and Sylvan for their exhaustive undertaking on the perception survey in the Philippines on APEC. I truly and deeply appreciate the penetrative insights provided by Francis, Dr. Francis, and for giving us a comprehensive perspective and context of the evolution of APEC. Meanwhile, the perception survey gives us some, some surprising results in the context uh, of the study uh, being undertaken uh, by Dr. Francis. APEC remains the most important multilateral engagement of the Philippines. Uh, it is both voluntary and non-binding. And just last week, the President affirmed our support for APEC and its initiatives by joining other fellow economic leaders in a virtual meeting. First time uh, this was done so, and in adopting the new APEC vision, uh, the uh, uh, APEC vision, APEC vision 2040, as well as the 2020 Kuala Lumpur Declaration. This is quite significant uh, because for the last two years, APEC leaders failed to attain a consensus on a leaders' declaration uh, since 2018. And uh, I hope to uh, address the recommendations submitted by Dr. Francis on the studies presented today. But before doing that, I wish to supplement and complement this incisive report and study uh, with uh, uh, re by recalling some of the uh, uh, the origins or the raison d'etre of APEC uh, in prefacing uh, Philippine engagement uh, in this very important forum. So in my next slide, uh, reading to the study uh, done by uh, uh, Dr. Francis here, he, um, I, I recall uh, 
back in 1989, uh, the, uh, the spark that uh, for APEC, and this is a foreign policy speech by then Australian Prime Minister Bob Hawke, where he uh, assessed in the text that it, if you click some more, you will see that uh, he talked about uh, exploring a possible government level edition of the Pacific Economic Cooperation Conference, which has then, had then existed back in, way back in 1980. And he was contemplating on an Asia Pacific version of the OECD. And uh, he was also contemplating the rise of newly industrializing economies at that time, 1989, and contemplating also some challenges uh, in GATT negotiations happening in that era. And I put here maybe some of the defensive position against fortress EU. Uh, EU single market came into four in 1993, and uh, the, the measure that uh, paved the way for that was undertaken in 1986. So in the next slide, um, the APEC agenda has pretty much been defined by uh, what, what uh, Francis Lin mentioned as the 1994 Global Goals, uh, which is on attaining a certain level of uh, free and open trade and investment in the Asia Pacific uh, in two watershed years, 2010 and 2020, for industrial economies and for developed economies. And you will see that uh, the, uh, the framers of this vision uh, we're contemplating an idea of open regionalism, regionalism here at this time. And this was uh, articulated by no less than the chair of the eminent persons group at that time, uh, Dr. Fred Bergsten. And basically, uh, open region APEC did not define open regionalism, but uh, espoused it by, by maintaining that uh, an arrangement or a, a, a cooperative forum like APEC enhances uh, global trade, not hinders it. And subsequently, uh, when the 1994 Global Goals matured this year, so we uh, uh, drafted a new vision, and the result is the APEC for July Vision 2040. And uh, this was uh, uh, also explained by Dr. Francis here, and uh, basically uh, 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 attaining this vision hinges on drivers of trade and investment, innovation, and digitalization and strong balance, secure, sustainable, and inclusive growth. In other words, quality growth is what we're looking for. And the APEC agenda is pretty much also underpinned, the next slide, by the three pillars of APEC, which is uh, trade and investment liberalization. Uh, we'll talk about reduction of tariffs and non-tariff barriers, uh, and pursuing regional economic integration, and uh, undertaking business facilitation by undertaking measures on increasing uh, Business processes, the take structural reform, and ensuring a resilient and robust supply chain. And uh, this is uh, the, the third pillar is something that I think presents the most uh, palpable benefit to many of our uh, workers on the ground here. And this is on the idea of building capacities uh, at many levels. And in the uh, over the years. Uh, the next slide, you will find that APEC has already uh, gone beyond uh, or, or actually uh, found that uh, in, in discussing all these uh, pillars, uh, a lot of, uh, we, we have to discuss other uh, issues and matters. So hence, APEC has expanded in scope over the years and has uh, working groups that tackle matters such as counter-terrorism, health pandemics, emergency preparedness, and climate change mitigation. And uh, also just to demonstrate the changes in the discussions and the evolution of the discussions in APEC in its three decades, uh, you will find in the next slide uh, some sort of a word uh, compilation of what has been being talked about in, uh, in, in the in tenure brackets uh, in APEC. First, of course, we were talking about uh, free and open trade and investment, the economic growth, uh, back in 89 to 1999, and then starting the next decade after that, we we're talking about um, FTAP, uh, integration, uh, and starting 2010, we we're talking about sustainable inclusive growth, digital economy. So the APEC is an evolving institution, but it's it's uh, underpinned by this uh, uh, the, the, the Bober goals and the uh, three pillars uh, that uh, we have mentioned earlier. So it is important to make an assessment on 
what it, what's in it for the Philippines in our engagement with APEC. And I, I, I often uh, refer to uh, uh, the fact that the Philippines belongs to APEC and we are benefiting and we are being heard. So in the next slide, we can firmly establish and as also mentioned by uh, the, the study, the Philippines belongs in, in APEC. Uh, APEC comprises 38% of the uh, global population, 60% of global GDP, 47% of global trade. And what is important is that our in engagement with APEC is defined by our status as, a, as, a, as, a, as an economy, not so much as a sovereign uh, entity. So we go by nomenclatures like custom territories, uh, we, and, and, and that helps uh, in our engagement with other entities, uh, both in APEC and WTO. And we discuss predominantly uh, trade and economic issues, and uh, uh, that is something that uh, we have retained and carried over the last 30 years. And the Philippines, in the next slide, uh, belongs in APEC because we are a founding member of APEC. Majority of our transactions around the world occurs within the confines of the 20 uh, one member, 20 member economies of APEC. 11 of the Philippines' top 15 trading partners are the APEC the economies. 56% of Filipinos abroad call the APEC region home, and they are responsible for 57% of remittances making its way to our economy. And as mentioned by Lim, 84% of the total trade with Philippines worldwide is with APEC, comprising of 82% of our exports and 85% of total imports. Our, our figures may vary, I just apologize. This is compiled by our economic research unit, so uh, there have been some variations in based on the year uh, of reckoning. Um, 64% of FDI in Philippines come from APEC economies, and 83% of tourist arrivals all come from the APEC member economies. And because of this, uh, a total of about and under this mechanism of engaging with APEC, uh, there are about 33 Philippine government agencies uh, connected with the technical board of APEC matters that facilitate our engagement with the APEC forum. And having established that we do belong in this forum, we can establish what, that we do benefit in the next slide, that and we benefit by uh, this very tangible uh, 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 vehicles uh, in APEC. And one, one such uh, is, is, is the APEC capacity building process. We have access to uh, funds devoted to building capacities of uh, APEC member economies, uh, valued at $50 million in the last five years, they having over 1,600 projects since 1993. Uh, this includes workshops and seminars, uh, studies. Um, and uh, these are conducted by uh, the various APEC working groups and task forces. And the last five years, uh, 29, ending 2019, there were 38 Philippine projects that received direct APEC funding worth about $2.4 million. And on trade and investment facilitation, this was quite prominent in uh, the studies on the APEC business travel card. Uh, this is pioneering uh, uh, endeavor by APEC, wherein uh, and, and wherein, wherein uh, it serves as a visa and uh, uh, status of residence for holders of this. It makes doing business easier, cheaper, and predictable in terms of trade and investment facilitation. And uh, also, uh, this is just to mention also that we have this initiative. Uh, just recently that we joined this initiative on cross-border privacy rules, uh, which hopefully will now pave the way for a more robust uh, uh, undertakings in our ever-growing digital economy. And in the, in the side of economic reform uh, and, and the mentioning uh, uh, furthering our domestic priorities, uh, it, it helps us uh, in this regard uh, by undertaking activities on the ease of doing business, regulatory reforms, competition policy, fiscal transparency, public sector governance, and strengthening economic and legal infrastructures. And so we belong and we benefit. And as Lynn said, we are being heard. In the next slide, we have hosted uh, APEC twice already back in 1996, where in 1996, the uh, Philippine uh, Manila Plan uh, was adopted uh, and articulated fully And in 2015, our hosting was devoted to MSMEs, uh, which uh, 
a more uh, several initiatives on the horizon after the agenda, the initiative to go MSMEs and the civil action plan uh, on financing MSMEs. And online initiatives included uh, the launching of the trade, deposit trade depository, the MSC marketplace, and the virtual knowledge center and services. And other initiatives uh, in that year of hosting is the APEC strategy for strengthening quality growth and the APEC disaster risk reduction framework. So brings us to my, my earlier uh, ponderings uh, in, shared, in sharing the ponderings of uh, Prime Minister Hawk. The next slide uh, gives us, uh, oh, uh, what, what's, what does APEC do? To be or not to be? And um, what is the backdrop of APEC's existence at this point? So the next slide gives us this background noise that we are reckoning with. If APEC was reckoning with uh, what was uh, Prime Minister Hawk thinking about Hawk at that time, this is currently what we need to reckon with in, our, in moving forward with our APEC agenda. The first and foremost, of course, the existential issues regarding the rules-based multilateral trading system represented by the World Trade Organization, the trade tensions between the US and China, uh, the maturing of the Boger Goals and the launching of the APEC Putrajaya Vision 2040, and um, framing uh, the, the two biggest economies, China and the US, framing their engagement in the region, whether in the, in the Pacific region or the Belt and Road initiatives, reckoning with the fourth industrial revolution, globalization, the next evolution of the globalization, rising inequalities that are correlated with uh, the growth of globalization, and circular economies and the different hues of uh, green, blue, red economies, and of course, uh, something that sort of blindsided many of us, the, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, this year. So uh, given this, uh, uh, these issues, uh, uh, it, 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 it more or less they're touched on by uh, what uh, uh, Francis uh, and, and, uh, presented in the study, and I try to to, uh, in the next slide, uh, put together the, the uh, core um, takeaways and recommendations in the studies uh, uh, with Dr. Francis here. And uh, he, he calls on utilize, utilizing trade agreements and trade facilitation. Certainly, we uh, we have demonstrated the, the wealth creating effects of expanding trade. Uh, but at the same time, I am in a more sobering and uh, maybe guarded uh, way, we should also look at uh, mitigating uh, the inequality aspects uh, undertaking uh, and the disruption being made uh, under trade agreements and trade facilitation. Uh, Lynn mentioned lateral initiatives, uh, bilateral, regional, multilateral. There is, in fact, also the other option of unilateral, which uh, New Zealand adopted. But of course, uh, the notion of a treaty agreement means that we get something in return. So maybe unilateral is something that is best reserved for targeted uh, partners. Uh, upgrade domestic facilities to meet global standards. Certainly, uh, we in the Foreign Service like to say that foreign policy and extension of domestic policy priorities. So definitely, uh, as Lynn said, uh, what we do in APEC is basically uh, in furtherance of our national uh, development goals and aspirations. Um, and uh, being able to engage with our, with our partners that we may be able to attain uh, uh, our aspirations, uh, our development aspirations. Aligning domestic regulations, I think uh, even in some aspects, uh, the Philippines is quite advanced, uh, and we certainly fall behind in many other things. So uh, it's a give, a give or take. Uh, there will be uh, certainly a, a good discussion on this. Maximize the economy's participation in APEC by adopting policies and best practice. This is precisely what ECOPEC is all about. Uh, and perhaps also we can see, I'd like to see further engagement and activity by the APEC Study Center Consortium, perhaps in expanding and improving your enhancing the linkages with the policy support unit. Um, this is certainly some, something that uh, we would uh, like to see uh, a bit more. Uh, now that we have a new vision uh, in place. Participation by Philippine stakeholders seeking uh, project funding. And as I said, this is the most palpable, most tangible benefit that we derive from APEC, our access to uh, funds that will help drive capacity building, uh, studies and research. Uh, and uh, we just recently held a 
uh, concept note uh, preparations workshop uh, this week. And uh, we hope to do more. And as Lynn said, uh, this is something that we will continue to pursue the next year. We do want to see more projects proposed by the Philippines and uh, for uh, the focal points, the focal agencies of each working groups and task force to reach out to stakeholders so that they may be able to uh, come up with meaningful projects and proposals. Information dissemination activities, communication is key, certainly. That has, that has been our number one, uh, one of our prominent uh, reminders to uh, uh, the senior officials uh, when we started on formulating the EPIC vision. Communication is very much a key uh, and, uh, and uh, to, to win uh, ownership to gain ownership by our stakeholders of what we do and requirements of the issuance of ABTC for Philippine citizens under review. This is been, being, has been done actually. Uh, our secretary has issued a new circular which will now make ABTC more accessible, uh, especially to Miss Miss. Initially, the impression as borne out by the study was that uh, it was only exclusive to the big corporations. Uh, and we, we, we uh, did a review of this and we found out that there, there are ways to shorten, the, to, to shorten the process and to lessen the requirements. And uh, we would like also to see that uh, uh, Filipino businessmen abroad can also benefit from the ABTC by applying for an ABTC in our foreign service post abroad. And the ABTC is also one of the uh, 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 enabling uh, um, mechanisms by which we hope to uh, address the lack of travel <laughs> at this point because of COVID. Uh, this was uh, articulated by Secretary Mon Lopez at the MRT. Perhaps we can uh, utilize uh, leverage uh, ABTC network or system. In fact, uh, there's ABTC is going paperless. Uh, you only need now to apply uh, online and uh, the application only check online for verifying the details. So I look forward to further discussions on this. And again, um, I wish to thank kids for taking this opportunity, uh, giving us this opportunity to discuss uh, uh, the importance of APEC in the Philippines and the importance of APEC as a non-binding platform and an integrator of ideas and uh, hoping for meaningful engagement for all stakeholders concerned in the Philippines in the EPIC process. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, um, Asat Samay. I part particularly drawn to your penultimate slide, which show, um, titles APEC State of Play because it shows the challenges, um, or the burning issues uh, confronting um, our APEC member states. So our, um, our presenter and our two uh, uh, discussions have established the fact that the Philippines is is uh, benefiting from APEC. And uh, looking at, at uh, the questions in our chat box, I think um, there's not much um, question about it. And most of the questions that we see here are mostly clarificatory. Um, I am drawn to proceed to the open forum. However, let us give our, um, our speakers uh, some time to breathe. So let's uh, have a short break first before the Q&A by having a poll. Um, so just like last week, we have a simple question, but this doesn't mean that our price is also simple. So two winners will each get this uh, brown, elegant looking PIDS notebook. So when are we ready with the question? Okay, so here is our question. Which among the following countries is not a founding member of APEC? A, Singapore, B, Philippines, C, Vietnam, and D, Japan. So we have uh, 10 seconds for this. So please uh, key in your answer now because we are, we are closing, now, closing the poll in three, two, one. Okay, so when could you please start um, the poll? We have ended the poll. Could you please tell us the, uh, the results of the poll? So the correct answer is C. So Vietnam is not a founding member. 
of the apex. So, ilan ang tamang sumagot? Okay. So, Webex is still... Okay. C, only 20 got the correct answer. And from the 20, we will get... Um, we will select two winners randomly. Don't worry about it. Okay, it's fair. We will pick it in a fair manner. And we will uh, select two winners who will get the PIDS notebook. And I will announce the winners during, uh, before we end the webinar. So just to, um, as mentioned by Dr. Kim by Ms. Presentation, 12 member states founded the, the APEC, and these include um, Australia, Brunei, Canada, Indonesia, Japan, Singapore, South Korea, Ma Malaysia, Thailand, United States, New Zealand, and the Philippines. Okay, let us now go to the open forum. So I would like to invite our speakers, Dr. Kimba, Ms. Akia, and, and Asek Tamayo. So um, to um, start our open forum, let us have a question which is related to your presentation, um, Francis. Yes, and this one is from Facebook. And um, okay. Okay, this one is from Tonio, Tonio Piano. I wonder if it is his real name. Okay, from Tonio Piano, what factors would explain the difference in perception of the respondents in items four and five from the actual performance of APEC? So looking at your presentation, I think he is referring to um, the result where um, and um, non-government institutions perceive that APEC has done little towards reducing customs waiting time and that non-NCR respondents perceive APEC's efforts towards addressing emerging issues poorly. They, they perceive it poorly compared to NCR respondents. Any thoughts, uh, um, Dr. Kimba Francis, uh, why we got these results? Francis, we can uh, hear you. Okay. Um, okay, so thinking, thinking about it, you know, I, I think it's really an, a matter of uh, communication, communication, because uh, the familiarity with uh, APEC is really uh, centered in the areas where there's a lot of talk uh, and the participation of the Philippines uh, outside. So uh, those who would be familiar with uh, the initiatives uh, in APEC related to customs, related to customs the ones that were, uh, would be in NCR, and then the ones in, in the regions, uh, uh, as, as Ms. Lin uh, has mentioned earlier, um, it's a good thing we bring to the top of mind uh, people's uh, ideas of APEC. But if we, we, but what is um, becoming more top of mind would be the issues that are related that are related to customs, and those are the ones that are being commonly being reported in media. So the inefficiencies, the problems that are being ex experienced by our importers and exporters. So these are the ones that would be the one that would be easiest to recall for, for the respondents. Of course, um, the, the, you know, how do we improve this? Uh, the, the way to do that is to really keep on uh, communicating, um, um, bringing forth uh, the, the, the ideas uh, of in, we, have done, we have done in, in order to realign our, realign our uh, search. You, we make it more uh, uh, accessible to not just those who are um, yeah, in Metro Manila and those who are uh, directly engaged in APEC, but also to those who are um, uh, studying studying APEC, uh, maybe the students, uh, maybe teachers, uh, economics, to so that it becomes um, easier um, part of the the way we we. Uh, teach uh, economics. So that would be my, my response to that question. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Francis, uh, do you know just non-government institutions, no? Um, are, are these from the, are these uh, the private sector or the business sector? 
would we do we have any idea francis uh yes ma'am uh the, the we the respondents are actually uh, we have um of course the government then we have um academe we also asked the academe and then we also sent out the the questionnaire to to ngos and even um student groups so it's it's a fairly uh, good distribution of uh, of uh, respondents okay the reason why i asked that is because in our um, um asian perception survey the one that you mentioned which um puts myself and dr um Yan conducted in uh, 2017 um, um we found that the business sector has a lukewarm attitude toward toward the asean so they do not have um, a, a favorable impression on um, the effectiveness or the usefulness of, of ASEAN. So, yeah. Okay, moving on, let's go to the other questions. And we have um, we have several from Mr. Dan Agustin of the Masaganang Sakahan. But let me just pick, you know, um, um, a few, if I hope you don't mind, Mr. Uh, Dan Agustin, so we can... Uh, give a um, uh, um, chance uh, for for the other for the questions of our our your uh, participants. So, and this is about the RCEP. Uh, he's interested about the main features of the RCEP and how it will benefit our economy. Perhaps we can I can throw this question to uh, Lynn, Miss Akia. Get, how you can enlighten us uh, on on uh, the features of the RCEP and how it will benefit uh, the Philippines. Okay, uh, okay. I'm not uh, I'm not really an expert on on the RCEP, but I will try to call in a friend who will help me. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Okay. Um, well, just to give, give numbers, uh, RCEP, the FTA, it accounts for twenty eight percent of the of world trade, 30% of world GDP, 24% of global FDA, FDI, and 34% of outward FDI. And it has a big population, so that's 2.2 billion. So that's a very big market. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Benefits to the Philippines, why do we need to join it? Well, um, since RCEP covers 50% of Philippine exports and 68% of import sources, it means that we will have uh, access for our Philippine exports to this RCEP country. And we hope that the, it will also this access will enhance over time. For Philippines, uh, import sources. This means we will have cheaper goods for production and manufacturing, efficient and convenient ways of trading, more transparent mm -hmm. rules, clear mechanisms for resolving trade issues and concerns, and inclusion of MISMIS in the uh, global value chain. It's important to note that 50% uh, of Philippine imports from RCEP are intermediate goods, meaning these are used by our manufacturers and, produ and producers. So this RCEP would be a great boost for our business operator. So that's just on the uh, trade side. There's trade side. also a lot of other uh, uh, positive benefits, that, such mm -hmm. as time-bound consultations and resolution of issues, because there is a chapter on uh, dispute, I think. And uh, on investment, it provides disciplines that will give more stable and predictable business environment for our investor, as well as for our professionals. It also institutionalizes institutionalize support and cooperation for our MISMIS. Uh, it will encourage new players and opportunities in the financial sector, the business services, manufacturing, IT, BPO. And uh, there's a uh, chapter on e-commerce and digital economy that will also help us further promote the digital economy and enhance the environment for e-commerce and stronger and more uh, better protection of intellectual property uh, property, property rights. Yeah. Thank we you can very provide much. you uh, um, links. I think eventually in our website, we will have that uh, on uh, the benefits from our staff. Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Lynn. Um, let us uh, have other uh, questions and this one is from okay from joseph okay where is that okay this one is from carminda sandal carmen and it has something to do with uh, um, the recent uh, typhoon and 
the, the series of typhoons that uh, uh, which has had, and he, she is, she wants to know if APEC has a window to help us recover in the, um, to help us recover from the devastations we have uh, encountered recently, and she she added we will that we will uh, new technologies if there is would be uh, uh, very helpful uh, in you know collaborating with uh, with institutions in order for us to um, have you know to strengthen our resilience to to this uh, uh, disasters. So a while ago, um, Francis was uh, in, in the presentation of Francis, he showed us two slides where there's so many working bodies within APEC and I suppose one of those bodies pertain to disaster preparedness and, the, and, and ASEC Tamayo he also uh, in, in one of his slides uh, mentioned that um, through the years APEC has expanded its scope to uh, cover also disaster uh, mitigation, disaster management, as well as climate change. So would you like to uh, uh, comment on this, uh, Asik Tamayo, please? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, and thank you for the question. Uh, indeed, uh, I, I also uh, conveyed that we received some we receive uh, words of uh, sympathy from our colleagues in APEC, given the uh, uh, typhoons, the super typhoons that, that crossed uh, virtually the same area uh, in the span of uh, a month, I think, or at least four of them. Uh, but yes, uh, there, there's the Emergency Preparedness Working Group that is currently uh, very active. And uh, this is... Um, uh, participated in by a focal agency in, in the Philippines, uh, the uh, NDRMC, uh, and uh, the DFA is also actually part of this uh, working group, and we do uh, uh, engage with uh, other counterparts. Um, and uh, a lot of uh, attention on the work of the EPWG was actually also uh, made, especially in the aftermath of Typhoon Haiyan, and we've been having uh, several meetings and discussions. The EP, EPWG, I think, uh, meets at least twice a year. Um, and uh, the key here is uh, in, in addressing the, the rapid response uh, and the uh, recovery, uh, facilitating recovery efforts here is uh, information uh, and uh, an exchange of uh, uh, good, if not best practices and technologies, uh, knowing about technologies, which was maybe mentioned by the uh, uh, person who posed the question. So, yes, uh, and and uh, it it, um, it this also reminds me of uh, uh, what the percep perception survey uh, in the study shows that uh, n not many people are aware that uh, we do address these issues, mm -hmm. and in fact, that is why we want to step up. Uh, this capacity building initiatives under APEC that are available to us so that if it's not the, uh, the focal agency to make, make the initiative, at least those the grassroots the stakeholders may uh, draw attention to this need to, to these uh, focal agencies so that they may now convey this, uh, this need uh, uh, and uh, see what can be done. We can look at the uh, 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 the number of uh, projects that have already been undertaken, we can draw lessons from that, and we can even uh, build on previous uh, projects and discussions in this uh, emergency preparedness work. So we look forward to a future, uh, to, 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 to a possible uh, uh, engagement that will address the concerns uh, of our clients. Thank you very much. Thank you too, Asik Namayo. Okay, we have an interesting question here from um, Dayanara Lausa, and uh, she is asking if we have a way to measure the Philippines' utilization of FTAs and other economic agreements uh, we enter into with our regional or trading partners in such a way that we are able to maximize our gains and cushion our losses. Um, 
Francis, uh, you want to answer this? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. um, one of your uh, research, um, the, the, uh, one of your studies that you have already undertaken or you are planning to undertake mm -hmm. concerns mm -hmm. this topic. <laughs> yes, actually, we we're just um, uh, we just found out that it can be released now as a discussion paper. So maybe in in a few days or in a few few weeks, months, it will be out as a new discussion paper of um, FTAs the, of the ASEAN plus one FTAs. Well, the Philippines mainly has uh, ASEAN plus ones. No, it's it's through the the ASEAN uh, FT uh, FTAs through the ASEAN. So it's mainly the ASEAN plus ones, and and we only have one, one, uh, the the Philippines Japan. The other one is um, um, Philippines EFTA, FTAs. Okay. But uh, the study that we did with uh, under area is uh, is looking at the utilization of uh, FTAs for the ASEAN plus ones. Or it's and we found that um, it's using the ones that's through AFTA, the ones through ASEAN. Okay. Of course, if, if there are a lot of uh, other uh, FDAs that's or or imports that's being if, if the importation is coming from China, most of the time it's going to be uh, using ASEAN China. But uh, um, there's a larger proportion. proportion. Yes, yes, there are ways. There are ways of, there are ways of uh, looking at uh, our utilization rate. But uh, I think a more important uh, uh, question is how do we ensure uh, that uh, the, the businesses or those who are uh, doing their importation find it easy, easier to just use the, the, the FPAs or to use the rules of, so that uh, they, they can uh, actually should we use uh, the the lower the lower tariff uh, tariff rates? You know? So uh, how do we how do we make it easier for them uh, so that it becomes um, uh, because uh, recently I've I've uh, asked I've uh, uh, for instance uh, what's happening to, to their importation? Uh, some of them are actually saying that uh, sometimes we we use form D. But sometimes they say that this is no longer applicable, so we use another form, or we just end up using the MFN. So you you know, uh, it, the rules have to be really set in stone, and it has to be implemented um, uniformly, so that the, the, our importers are, do not um, get discouraged when they uh, try to use the the forms or our our FTA. Uh, that would be all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kimba. Uh, Ms. Akia, uh, would you like to add to what uh, Francis has just um, mentioned within BTI? Would you have any uh, uh, has a, a study been, been conducted or would you have uh, any figures or some evidence showing the utilization of, um, of our free trade agreements? Um, yes, Dr. Sheila. I was told by my colleague from the ASEAN division that they actually within the ATIGA there is an exchange of import data, so there yes, should yes. be at least an export utilization uh, or uh, uh, a number that they work on. And I remember many many years ago we had a concern because the utilization rate was very low, and then mm -hmm. we improved. So that means they have a study, they have external data. But I was also uh, warned by our colleagues that the, the BOC doesn't record export utilization. So there's some issue probably there on the collection of data from the BOC side because all of this data they go through the customs. So yon, we, we cannot uh, um di na po namin yeah. But it would it is going to be useful to have those information on that. We have them for our trade negotiators because kailangan po namin yung basic yung mga ganyan. Especially when you're doing the review, like what we will be doing uh, with Japa. Thank you very much, Ms. Akia. Okay, um, another questions. This one is from uh, uh, Director Richard uh, Balyester uh, from, from the NEDA. How do we ensure that ATEC matters 
um, or agenda will benefit our existing and potential uh, trade um, agreements. Okay, perhaps I can uh, we can hear first from um, Asek Tamayo, then Sherry Lynn. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I seem to have missed this, the last part, the second part, sorry. Uh, it's uh, okay. Yes, from Richard uh, Balyester, how do we ensure that EPIC matters or agenda will benefit our existing and potential trade agreements? Yes, uh, well, I'll, I will venture uh, an answer here, but probably Lynn will uh, better address this. Uh, much of uh, the, uh, the stated uh, agenda of uh, APEC has been to align itself with the World Trade Organization. Uh, and uh, that has been since, since the, since the Bower goes. Uh, APEC has been probably been more um, uh, deliberative in its approaches in trying to promote uh, regional economic integration. And the work devoted the last, uh, in its second decade on the FTAP uh, is a testament to uh, this uh, uh, interest to encourage this, uh, engagements uh, among member economies. And um, the, the, the key here is now to look at our uh, priorities, development priorities as articulated in the uh, Ambition 2040 Development Plan, the Sustainable Development Goals 2030, uh, which is why now we have the additional put the goals 2040 that will ser serve as a, another um, reference point for us to, to, uh, to be able to note uh, milestones and achievements uh, in, in furtherance of our domestic development agenda. And uh, it is uh, in this context that uh, the, the pursuit of uh, and in the pursuit of uh, regional economic integration, and, uh, um, that the trade is better, best facilitated through an FTA. And uh, we, we, we won't be surprised seeing a lot more initiatives. Uh, but first and foremost, our, our, our priority is, of course, uh, bringing back some semblance of order and uh, predictability uh, under the WTO. Uh, but I, I, I will. Uh, asking to elaborate more on this. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you, Asik, Eric. Um, um, it's hard to answer that question because I see these things as two different issues. There's the APEC side, which is not an FTA and non-binding, and then there's the FTA side, which is binding. So it's really up to us internally, the Philippines, to make use of the FTA. We negotiated and spent a lot of resources on this, and it should be used Parang sayang po if we do not use it, diba? So it, it rests upon us, uh, the trade department and all the agencies who were involved in the, in the negotiations to make sure that people are using it and benefiting from that uh, rules. On the other side, there's APEC. And APEC has always been a champion of uh, comprehensive, high-quality FTAs. And what they're trying to do what is uh, provide some capacity building so that we, have a, we will have better understanding of the uh, issues we will be able to negotiate better. Our negotiators are trained, they're able to uh, come to the table more prepared. So those are the things that will help us, uh, in a way, make this FTA more effective um, in the process of negotiating an agreement, in the process of reviewing them and all. I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much, Asakamaya and Ms. Uh, uh, Akia. Okay, um, we have a uh, question here. Uh, Ma'am Sheila, can I say something? Yes. Sure, go ahead, Francis. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, so thank you, Richard, for that question. That's it. Let me start my video. Okay. So thank you, Richard, for that question. Um, so how do we ensure? I, I think, um, so it's, it's really... Uh, I, let me just add to what uh, Ms. Lynn ha, has said. No? So it, she's right. Uh, we, what we really want is that, uh, that the issues that are being discussed, because um, APEC is an incubator of ideas. Eh? So the, 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 
the really important issues that are relevant for us. We get to learn about it, we hear about it um, beforehand, before it's even discussed in the, the more, more um, uh, open general forum um, earlier. And so it's the, the pressure now is really on us on, on the domestic side to make use of these um, transfer of uh, uh, ideas and yes and these concepts in in our uh, trade agreements and in our uh, existing uh, trade agreements. So you, um, my, my, my point really is that the, the incubator of ideas, we should really um, uh, take advantage uh, of particip our participation in APEC, uh, try to get as many ideas as we can, and then incorporate this in our domestic uh, policy and in all the trade agreements. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, maybe Richard will know um, about this. I, I always keep on asking him about this. No? So whenever I am looking for a, a document that would really define our trade strategy, and I ask him, uh, where is trade in the Philippine Development Plan? Well, in chapter. <laughs> so there is really no specific chapter related to the to trade. So well, of course, it's of course enshrined in the uh, strengthening industry and services uh, as a chap as chap uh, as a strategy. But you know that that the general trade strategy and uh, a strategy in terms of our um, engagement, some um, engagement, uh, siguro na hindi pa siya nailagay dun sa sa Philippine Development Plan. But we but we. Yeah, we can make use of our engagements uh, outside as a means of uh, improving our domestic policies and uh, making use of our FPA. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Francis. Okay. Um, there's a question from... Mm -hmm. Okay, from, from Mr. Dan Agustin, and he's asking... Um, and he asked, what, what agenda should the Philippines advance in the next APEC conference to further her economic uh, recovery? I believe the next uh, host economy is uh, of the APEC is New Zealand, if I am not mistaken. So it, it will be a good way for New Zealand to uh, hear the discussions on uh, a sustainable and resilient economies. Um, given the successes of New Zealand in this aspect. And also, um, their, uh, it, its experience, uh, the experience of New Zealand in um, combating uh, the pandemic. Uh, would you like to comment on this? Uh, give your feedback, uh, Asik Pamayo? Yes, uh, certainly. Uh, thank you very much for that question. Um, and I, I'm, I'm trying to, to uh, pull up my, my, my file on the New Zealand uh, uh, hosting. Uh, but basically, uh, what, what we expect to see uh, next year is uh, a carryover of uh, uh, the common threads that we've seen the last uh, five, six years, especially when we hosted in 2015, that of inclusivity, sustainability, um, and uh, of course, recovery, uh, a resilient uh, and robust uh, recovery from uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we are seeing a lot of, and, we, and next year, uh, what's important is that uh, we are asked to come up with the implementation plan of the uh, APEC Putajaya Vision 2030. We have come up with a vision and our task next, next year now is to craft an implementation plan. So. Um, uh, with that, we will now examine the elements of the vision uh, and, uh, and uh, see how we can now uh, craft uh, an appropriate plan, something that uh, can be embraced by our ministers and by, uh, by our leaders at the end of the year. So look to see that uh, implementation plan adopted by our leaders by the end of the year. Um, of course, there are some other priorities of New Zealand that we are looking at. Um, uh, one of the more pronounced uh, aspects of New Zealand's uh, priorities would be probably engagement with the uh, indigenous peoples. Um, and uh, the, trying to assess the contribution of the indigenous peoples to the economies in APEC. 
Um, there's an interesting article, by the way, from Justice Carpio on Philippines and Indonesia post today. I want to read that. Uh, that's that's something that we, among other things, that we look at. And other furthering the other agenda on, on the other bills, trade and investment, uh, structural reform. Uh, probably we'll see a meeting of the ministers. Uh, there will probably be some other meetings of other other things taking place on other sectors, but uh, those are the top of mind uh, um, issues that I think will be will figure prominently in our discussions. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Sec Tamayo. Um, Miss Lynn, I, I saw you nodding your head. Would you like to add to that, or I just had a discussion with uh, one of the advisors of the SOM chair for New Zealand, and he shared with us that. Next year, New Zealand will be hosting only three ministerial meetings on top of the normal uh, trade ministers and finance ministers meetings. So the three ministerial meetings will be on structural reform, meat needs, and uh, food security. So you'll see from there what their priorities are. But uh, for us, for at least for the DTI side, we would like to see. Well, as Eric mentioned it already, uh, the implementation of Putrajaya Vishad. We, we want to see uh, work uh, to be done on, on uh, at least get a, a, a good implementation plan. I mean, it's good to have a vision, but it's also better to have an implementation plan. And we want to see elements of the of WTO, APEX support for the WTO and multilateral trading system, in particular, how we can address the agriculture and the Doha development issues, the reform of the WTO, and also the new interests that the WTO is working on, including on meat needs and e-commerce and uh, other joint statement initiatives. We're also keen, Secretary Lop is very keen on APEX work on innovation, how we mm -hmm. can support economic recovery, uh, not just from the pandemic, but also going forward uh, as we embrace uh, the digital economy, as we set in in the IR4 and all, and also uh, how we can uh, work on really giving uh, parang flesh on uh, strong, balanced, secure, in sustainable, and inclusive goals. So there will come in our work on the meat needs, but there should be others also. Then we're also interested on the unfinished work of Dogor. Uh, there's a lot that was not uh, finished. And internally, madami pa po tayong gawin in terms of reform. So we hope that we can work with the other agencies on this one. Uh, in, in particular, on the services area, we were actually one of the forerunners of the services agenda in APEC when we had the services cooperation framework and that gave rise to the services competitiveness roadmap. And in the services area, our particular focus would be on the logistics sector, how we can further increase this and how we can bring down the cost and the time of doing this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lynn. Okay, um, we are down to our uh, last two questions. So here is um, a second to the last question from Joseph. Joseph Solis, how should how should we convince politicians and the general public to support initiatives in reforming our foreign investment policy? That is the removal of the 6040 Filipino foreign equity restrictions by constitutional amendment and revisions of the uh, FINL to comply with the investment chapter requirements of the RCEP or joining the CPTPP. Okay, Miss Lynn, would you like to um, Share your thoughts on this, then I call uh, Francis um, after you. Well, that's really hard to answer. Hard to answer, yes. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. right? That has been uh, an issue for a long, long time. But you mm -hmm. know, uh, some economies actually still have uh, a lot of restrictions also. They're able to work around it. So, mm -hmm. siguro, if you cannot touch the constitution, it's just really on the on some of the regulations that we can mm -hmm. work on. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, it should not uh, prevent us from attacking more investments. We should yes. work on the other areas, like the cost of power, uh, providing yes. a more open and any yes, ease of doing business. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. So those areas. I don't want to touch about constitution because it's a long story. Okay. Uh, but you know, right. we, we also work closely with, with uh, legislators. Like when we were doing the information tech uh, Internet Transactions Act. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is the, from Senator Win Gatsalian and also mm -hmm. Congressman Gatsalian. They were very keen uh, on the work of APEC on uh, e-commerce. So there's also an interest that 
from them on the routine than the, the apex. So if you could feed to them with those ideas, siguro baka magiging mas madali. That's right. Okay. Uh, Dr. Kemba, would you like to add anything to what uh, Lynn has just mentioned? Francis? Dr. Yes. Kemba? Uh, yes. So we're talking about convincing politicians, right? And the general public to support initiatives in reforming our foreign investment policy, investment policy. Yes, we're we're referring question. to that question, no? Because I didn't hear it uh, clearly yet. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So, um, I think one way is really to benchmark um, ourselves with uh, the rest of the countries in the region, with APEC or uh, even with uh, OECD or with other countries. So, we can see uh, the level of uh, restrictiveness where we are in terms of our level of restrictiveness. And um, there are a number of um, regional uh, economic intellectuals by a number of our uh, partners. For instance, for instance, there's the, the ARCHI, the A uh, ASEAN Regional uh, Cooperation Integration Index uh, by A ADB. And then there's uh, other uh, indices that that uh, look at um, how integrated we are uh, as a region and uh, because in those in those indices there are some indicators that um, try to look at how how restrictive you are and um, so whether you are restrictive in terms of government procurement in terms of how many sectors uh, do you still have in terms of the 6040 which sectors are uh, totally preventing uh, the participation of foreign uh, investors. So um, we can actually see uh, where we are in this, uh, in this spectrum. And I think uh, Ms. Lin is also correct. Um, even if we do, um, we, can, we, we can see where we are in this spectrum, and then we can say that we, we may want to uh, improve a little bit with, with, regard to, uh, with regards to other, uh, some of these things. But again, um, we should um, make our goals a little bit more um, realistic. But, you know, uh, the 60-40, it's a it will really require a constitutional uh, amendment that's, that may take time. It will be re really very... Uh, look at uh, certain areas of, of where that can be done. Don't uh, miss the, the long-run goal of uh, eventually liberalizing these sectors. Um, when we have when there is the opportunity to, to do so. Ah, thank you. Thank you very much, Francis. Okay. Uh, this last question actually is not related to the study. It's actually a question about where is that? Okay. Um, about um, bids. Uh, opening some of its materials uh, and making it available to university libraries outside of MCR. So I think it's, it's his talking. He's talking of, about the possibility of having, you know, a, a PIDS uh, coroner in their uh, in their place in in an, um, at the University of San Jose Recoletos Library. Uh, sir, I, I, I missed the name of this person who asked the question. Okay, from um, it was asked by Mr. Roberto Cabardo. Uh, sir, my team uh, oversees the uh, the uh, uh, in the implementation of the uh, Kids Corner project of the IDS, and we will uh, explore uh, if this is possible. So you can send us an, an email and uh, so uh, we can uh, explore the possibility of having a PIDS foreigner uh, um, established in your place, in your, in your university. But um, you, can have, you have full access to the, the studies of PIDS through our website, sir, uh, pids.gov.ph. So all of these are downloadable. So even if you don't have a... Um, if the physical copies we have, we can um, have all the electronic copies of our knowledge products uh, by going to our website. Okay, so that, uh, friends, um, we have we still have 
a few questions in our chat box, we, but um, in as much as we we would like to uh, cover everything, we we have no more time. So at this point, may I request uh, some final words from our uh, speakers? Uh, if you have any final message to say to our uh, to our uh, audience, uh, starting off with uh, let's start off with. Uh, 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 with uh, Lynn, Miss Lynn Akia, then uh, to be followed by um, Asik Tamayo, and finally our speaker, Dr. Francis Kimba. Miss Lynn? Thank you, Dr. Sheila. And uh, thank you to everyone for coming. I hope that we can do more of these kinds of conversations. It will help us communicate to you what's happening in APEC and also help us really firm up our position in APEC and also in the other engagements. We'll, uh, and I copy pasted your questions. I'll try to answer some of them, those that we can, and then we will share it with the PIDF. Thank you again to everyone. And thank you, Ms. Akia. It's a pleasure to have you in uh, in our uh, webinar. I think suki na natin si Lynn, uh, we had her in the past ng mga, mga press ko namin natin sa PIDS. And Hi, Ms. Lynn. Mayo, it is our uh, honor and pleasure to have you in our webinar, sir. And uh, you have your message, sir. Would you like to say something as, as your final words to our audience? Thank you. And, and likewise, uh, uh, well, thank you uh, for, for inviting us uh, and uh, for giving us this opportunity to articulate uh, APEX activities uh, and our engagement uh, in the APEC process. Uh, this year has been very challenging. Um, and we had our first virtual EELM. And next year, New Zealand will be all virtual. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it may be that way. It has its inherent advantages as well. I mean, a lot more people will probably get to participate in the activities now that uh, most of all of the meetings are virtual. So uh, we hope that we can leverage and utilize this opportunity now uh, in the virtual fashion, the virtual platform to to uh, help spread the, the uh, and, and uh, facilitate the engagement activities. Um, and it saves us also uh, for travel from our travel funds. So, <laughs> so uh, that's that's basically what I look forward to. Uh, maybe if the situation improves, then maybe there will be a return to in-person meetings. But in-person meeting has been very important to APEC. Uh, and uh, that's something that uh, is essential, uh, I would say. But uh, we need to adjust and adapt. And this is an example of the kind of adjustment that we need. So uh, uh, we look forward to meaningful accomplishments next year in New Zealand. Hosting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Asik Tamay, and hope to have you again in, in our future events here at PIDS. And uh, of course, Dr. Francis Kimba, our uh, lead author and presenter. Francis. Uh, all right. So first, let me thank our discussants. I, I forgot to thank them earlier when I had a chance to speak. So let me thank uh, Ms. Lynn and uh, Sir Eric for uh, um, providing helpful comments to the paper. And uh, I, I really, well, first, I, I really miss seeing them in person and when uh, attending the technical board on APEC Matters. Uh, but we re we're really faced with a difficult time, and uh, we are we are now leveraging the use of uh, of technology in order to be able to be more productive uh, despite the challenges of this pandemic. And uh, this this uh, is another opportunity for us to be able to present our work on not just on. Uh, uh, on APEC, but also a lot of other topics. The, the PITS webinar is a very useful uh, uh, tool that we were able to share to uh, able to share findings. And I, I is my understanding correct? This is the last one. Yes, this is this the last one. Yes, it is. Hmm. I, 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 right. I am, so uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the, the last. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I'm the. Oh, sorry, sorry, I, I I took your your announcement, but yeah. So, but anyway, um, my 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 point really is that uh, um, APEC has uh, has brought with us a lot of uh, opportunities, and uh, 
it allows us also to engage not just with the people domestically but also with our partners outside and even with the, the pandemic we are all able to discuss and even form partners partnerships with uh track of that and we should always maximize and participate in, in these types of um uh, efforts so that would be my uh, final word for this uh uh, presentation. Thank you very Thank you much, very Dr. Much. Uh, Kimba. Nice background you have there. You have lots of, of trees. Okay, friends, on that note, um, please join me in thanking our speakers um, for the insights, for the knowledge that they have shared in our webinar this afternoon. Uh, let's give them a big virtual clap. And thanks also to all those who, partic who participated in our Q&A. Okay. At this point, um, I would like to announce the names of the two winners of our poll uh, for this webinar, and they are Prabeltan and Jeremiah Picasso Atento. And so each of you will get um, um, a PAB, and our team will get in touch with you in the coming days. For friends, uh, just a few before. Uh, Oh, just like our previous uh, webinars, as all the questions, and screen, um, after then we will uh, email you the link. Visit our um, pages, our social media. Okay. Go our website and see all our Facebook viewers and also uh, um, uh, which we use. Okay. And uh, um, to acknowledge the various organizations, government, civil society, business, and international to find us today on the screen, and we will get post the webinar. Okay, um, friends, um, this as a uh, Kimba mentioned, well, this is our last webinar for the year. Uh, well, it is the last webinar for the year, and we have conducted around, you know, a total of, I think, no, if I'm not mistaken, 27 uh, webinars this year and had more than 5,000 uh, attendees. We thank all the speakers from our first webinar in May up to the last one that we have just conducted. Expertise or time. Of course, this webinar series would not, if not for our participants uh, on WebEx, correct, uh, uh, regular participants of our webinar series. So maraming maraming salamat po. Um, it has been a pleasure bringing you evidence based studies and providing an avenue for informed and objective discussion of policy issues through this virtual series. So, goodbye for now, but we will see each other again when we resume this stay informed too. Thank you. Maraming salamat po. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And bye. Thank you, everyone. Merry everyone. Christmas. Hi, Miss Lynn. Hi, Sir Eric. Bye. Bye. Take care. <laughs>